Hi, everyone. Welcome to this live discussion brought to you by the World Science Festival. I'm Brian Green. I am coming to you live from my office in the physics department at Columbia University, the Center for Theoretical Physics. And our discussion today will be with Stephen Wolfram, a name that many of you are quite familiar with from so many contributions from Mathematica, which has had such a profound influence on the kinds of science that we are able to undertake, Wolfram Alpha, the Wolfram language. Of course, Stephen is a physicist at heart. That's where his initial training began, and our conversation will focus on some of the work that he's been doing recently in trying to give us a perhaps different way of thinking about the fundamental laws. And I, before I bring Stephen on, I just want to quickly say, look, you know, those of you who have followed physics and science more generally, perhaps through World Science Festival events or books, your own studying, look, you know that our goal, which really was articulated perhaps most succinctly by Albert Einstein, is, you know, trying to figure out the fundamental laws of the universe. As Einstein said, did God have any choice in the creation of the universe. And he wasn't talking about God in any conventional sense. What Einstein meant was, is there any freedom in the way the laws of the universe are constructed in the form that they take? Or is there some principle that we're still struggling to find that would lead us ineluctably, inevitably to a unique description of physical reality. And that's an important question because look, we have developed over the course of the 20th century, the 21st century, general relativity, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, string theory, far more speculative, of course, but I can't help but throw it into the mix. And as we go ever deeper toward grasping the fundamental laws, the fundamental mathematical equations in the way that we typically frame those laws, there are two questions that come to the fore. Number one, have we got the fundamental laws? Of course, that's vital. And we all agree that that's an ongoing search, an ongoing process. No one would say that today's laws are the laws. But even if sometime in the future we do have those fundamental laws, a key question will be why those laws and not some other laws? And if we can show that there's a unique set of laws that meets some very basic set of criteria, and that would certainly help answer that question. Or perhaps we'll be forced to go the other direction and say, well, it's not why this law instead of that law. Perhaps all possible laws in some sense are out there. And we as particular observers of the world only have access to or only are aware of a certain slice of reality that's well described by the particular laws that we have developed. That's a possible direction that this all will go. And Stephen Wolfram has been developing ideas which perhaps it's fair to say intertwine and thread through all of those interesting scientific and philosophical ideas in our goal today will be to tease out exactly where Stephen Wolfen's program is at the moment and where it might be heading. So with that, let me bring in Stephen Wolfram. Hey, Steve, Hello. how are you doing? Just fine. Great to see you. Nice to see you too. And where are you at the moment physically? Concord, Massachusetts. Ah, are you home? Yeah. Ah, excellent. Um, so I've been a work from home guy for for your whole life. Years. Yeah, right. Well, long before it was fashionable. You know, speaking of that, I just do have a, a quick question, completely irrelevant for our conversation. But somebody asked me the other day, and I did not know the answer to it. Across all of your endeavors, Wolfram Research, uh, Mathematica, and, and, and how, how many people work with you? I mean, what's your grand total employee base? Yeah, it's about 800 people. It's 800 a fairly people. small operation. Yeah, um, and it's it's uh, my my basic principle has been automate as much as possible. So yeah. we've been kind of over the years, you know, what we can do with with just eight hundred people is uh, uh, you know, lots of leverage from lots of automation, and it's yeah. uh, 
uh, you know, I I built the tools we've uh, been developing for so long, partly because I wanted to use them myself. And turns out, you know, I've I've managed to alternate between doing basic science and building technology about five times in my life so far. And it's pretty neat because, you know, you you build a bunch of science, you see what tools can be built, you build the tools, then that lets you build another level of science. And, yeah. and for example, the things things I've been doing recently in physics, they are the result of multiple rounds of this kind of science technology iteration, so to speak. Would it be fair to say when it comes to early on in your career, and again, maybe I'm not framing it in the way that you would, so please feel free to correct, but would you say that your goal at some point was to drill down in computation and find the fundamental ingredients that underlie all computation in some universal manner that would allow you to create a system like Mathematica that would be widely applicable because it wasn't stuck on any particular computational framework, but rather was the the er the basis of all computation. Yeah, I mean, you know, I what I thought I was doing at the time when I did it is not what I've understood I was doing decades later. Mm. But you know, projecting backwards. Uh, when I, you know, I had done physics when I was a teenager and so on, and uh, particle physics and cosmology and things like that, and you know, the one of the one of the things that is always a challenge there is doing the calculations, and I had wanted to automate that, and then sometime it was around end of 1979, so ancient times. Yeah, uh, I kind of was like, I want to make it as automatic as possible to do the kinds of computations that I and other people want to do. And the question was, how do you do that? And I guess from my life in natural science, kind of the obvious thing to do was try and find the primitives, the underlying sort of atomic uh, elements of computation. But what I, uh, I mean, projecting backwards, so to speak, one of the things that's a challenge is, what is computationally possible is vastly broader than what we humans care about. Yeah. So what, you know, first step is how do you represent what is computationally possible? That's actually rather easy. Much more challenging is to build the bridge from the way that we think about things to the what's computationally possible. And that's been kind of my lifetime activity of sort of building a computational language, a notation for computation that is convenient for us humans and that can tap into this kind of reservoir of power in the computational universe. And that's yeah. been, so that will be my kind of way in modern times of explaining what, what I've been doing for the last 40 something years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, I think many people who are watching this or will watch this subsequently, they have made use of the tools that you have built, but perhaps for the one or two in the audience that perhaps have not, let me just note, you know, from a personal perspective, it's not just that the tools that you have provided, I'm speaking of Mathematica in particular, allows us to do things more easily. It allows us to do computations that we would not have the boldness to even contemplate doing without having the tool in place. And I'm thinking specifically years ago when I was doing work in string theory that was trying to use something that I uh, thankfully played a role in developing called mirror symmetry to calculate what were known as a number of rational curves on certain calabial manifolds, right? The calculations, we could set them up, but without a tool like Mathematica, it would be virtually impossible to actually carry forward with them. But, you know, with what you had, we could set it up and hit a button and sit back and the machine would just spit out number after number after number calculating exactly what we are seeking so that's it's great more, yeah yeah yeah, it's, yeah and it's but the beautiful thing is what you're willing to attempt to undertake can be profoundly impacted by the tools at your disposal it's it's a very non-linear process between the two yeah i mean the, the way i see what i'm trying to do is to give people a way to think computationally about things it's kind of like in the analog in mathematics was before kind of 500 years ago or something, when you wanted to talk about mathematics, you'd just be using words and natural language. Yeah. And then people started inventing mathematical notation and plus signs and equal signs and things. And then it all got very streamlined and you could start to actually, you could have a mathematical language in which to think mathematically. And that's, yeah. you know, you got algebra and calculus and then all the mathematical sciences and so on. 
And you know, kind of what I see as our mission is to provide that kind of computational notation, that kind of computational language for thinking about things computationally. And I think the uh, the thing that you know, when we say what what does it mean to think computationally about things, it's kind of like we define rules for how things work, and then we see the consequences of those rules. And that's a that's a very general kind of activity. Yeah. And the question of sort of what types of rules are ones that, for example, relate to the kinds of things that we humans care about, that's kind of the art of designing a computational language is to be able to represent those kinds of things. And I, I mean, I suppose, do you, but do you yeah. imagine, and then we'll get into this when we, when we turn to physics in, in just a moment, but just speaking more generally, you know, at some point we have some conversation with some extraterrestrial civilization and we ask them about, you know, how do you go about trying to quantify or to think more deeply about the nature of the challenges that reality presents you? Will they, do you think, have the same computational basis as we do? Or is it just a quirk of our evolutionary process that we think about the world in a particular way and that gives us one slice through the computational universe? Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a bigger conversation, but I, I think this this whole kind of idea about you know can you think about the world being built from rules? I think that's a very general idea. I think that the way in which you package those rules and the way that you kind of perceive and think in terms of those rules that's pretty specific. And so my my tendency is to say, for example, if you say, well, we talk about the extraterrestrials, you know, the alien intelligences and so on. My feeling is. There are alien intelligences all around us. You know, the weather famously is supposed to have a mind of its own. And I think in many real senses it does. It's just that that mind is not well aligned with the kind of mind that we have. If we look at, you know, the neuron firings in our brains, they're following physical laws. They're doing what they do. If you look at the fluid dynamics in the atmosphere, it's following physical laws. It's doing what it does. And the question is, can we say that the stuff going on in our brains is in some fundamental sense more sophisticated than what's going on in the atmosphere? I don't think so. I think the issue is that what's going on in our brains is kind of our perception of kind of this, this notion of intelligence. It's aligned in a particular direction. It's different from the alignment of you know, the, the, the fluid dynamics in the atmosphere or whatever else. So I tend to think that this, this question of you, you ask, sort of will the aliens, so to speak, have the same view of computation, I think at the lowest level, it's kind of things are operating according to rules. If you ask kind of how would, what, what is the internal narrative of the aliens, the internal narrative of the weather, the internal narrative for our brains, those are different. And, you know, this is the sort of the essence of what we do when we do science is we try and take the natural world as it is out there. And we try and kind of put it into a narrative that we humans can understand. I mean, that's what, when we yeah. say we're making a theory for something, you know, the thing out there is just doing what it does. The question is, do we have a way with it within our minds, within our way of thinking about things to kind of talk about what it's doing, so to speak. And but, I think um, that, yeah. but along those lines, I, I can't help. And I, I, I hope that you're willing to sit for a little while because I'd like to pursue this just for a moment and then get to the real topic of our conversation here because I don't think they're separate, actually. I think there's a deep connection between it all. But you talk about the internal representation or the internal experience. And I think that is, for most people, what distinguishes our kind of computation from the computation of the weather, right? I don't think most people... I mean, Thomas Nagel had this famous dictum that if you're wanting to describe consciousness you should ask the question what is it like to be that thing you know what is it like to be a human we have a reasonable good understanding of that because we are of that category what is it like to be a bat right does a bat have an inner world of consciousness and we can certainly imagine that the answer to that question is yes even though it's very difficult to put ourselves into the mind of a bat but when it comes to the weather I think most people would resist the idea that there is a what it is like to be the weather. Do you think there is a what it is like to be the weather? Yes. Hmm. I mean, I think that, you know, if we look at all any of us ever know is our own personal internal experiences. Yeah. Even the extrapolation to, you know, another human's experiences. Very tough. Is just, an, you know, empathetic extrapolation. And Agreed. by the way, 
when you are imagining what a human with a different coming from a different time in history or with a different kind of set of educational or cultural backgrounds and so on is, it's not completely trivial to take your inner thinking patterns and project them. Agreed. And you know, if you start thinking about, uh, you know, what's it like to be a computer? You know, you start thinking about what is the experience of a computer from the time it's booted up to the time it crashes, it's kind of like a human lifespan. It remembers certain things, it has certain experiences, maybe somebody, you know, plugs a peripheral into some port and it has some horrible trauma, all kinds of, all kinds of things like this. It is, as, as you trace it through, it is surprisingly and bizarrely similar in external description yes. to the kind of thing that, that we feel. And I, I think it's, it's one of these things where this question of, for example, you talk about laws of physics, and there's this question of we are projecting what is actually happening out there in the world into our particular kind of internal representation of what's going on. And you, know, you were talking about sort of the inevitability or not of the laws of physics. One of the things that's been a huge surprise to me in the last couple of years is that from what I can tell, there is in some sense a complete inevitability of the core laws of 20th century physics for observers like us. In other words, if, if we were not as we are, if we had different characteristics, we would believe that the world has laws different from the ones that we believe that it has. But the thing that's been a big surprise to me is that it turns out that the, you know, you might say, well, does it depend on the fact that we have two eyes? Does it depend on this? Does it depend on that? It depends on, on sort of two very big things and one subsidiary thing. It depends on the fact that we are computationally bounded observers of the universe. That is, there's all this computation going on in the universe, but to stuff it into our finite minds, we need to sort of simplify it a lot. That's one thing. The other thing that is, uh, uh, is that we believe we are persistent in time. Yeah. That is, even in, you know, we'll talk about in, in actual models of physics, we are in, in you know, our models, we're made of different atoms of space at every moment in time. Yet, we believe that we have this single thread of experience going through time. And there's a third thing, actually, which is we're a certain size relative to the underlying stuff in the universe. For sure. You know, we're not, uh, and the fact that, for example, to, to give a, an example sort of close to the kinds of things I think you've thought about a long time, you know, our notion of time and space depends a lot on how big we are. That is the fact that, you know, we look around and we see, you know, 10, 100 meters away and light comes to us from that distance. Speed of light is pretty fast. And that means that, you know, in a microsecond, a millionth of a second, we'll have seen what's around us. Our brains process things on more like thousandth of a second time scales. So for us, we see the world as a series of kind of frames of this yeah. is what space is like. We say, we say it's out there because we see it sort of all at the same time. But. Right. If we were, for example, if we thought a million times faster, replace our brain, brain hardware with you know, digital electronics, we'll think a million times faster, we would have a different point of view. Because sure. then, you know, the, the, the scene that we're in, if we were in the same size scene, it would be coming to us in, in time short compared to the time it takes us to process it. We think Same of space more like time, presumably, if we... Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it, it's a... So, I mean, there are these aspects of kind of the way we are as observers that cause us to perceive the world the way we perceive the world. The big surprise to me has been the very technical fact that the big laws of 20th century physics, statistical mechanics, technical thermodynamics, you know, general relativity and quantum mechanics seem, so far as we can tell, to be not optional. They are inevitable features of observers like us. This is what observers like us will have to see as they sort of try to understand what's out there in the world, which is, to me, remarkable. I mean, we'll talk about this maybe more, but, but you know, this idea that it is conceivable to not just wheel in the laws of physics as a, oh, it happens to be that way, but to be able to say that at least for observers like us, the laws of physics, as we have discovered them, are inevitable. On that, along those lines, though, and again, we will get into some of the details, but to characterize the phrase observers like us, you've made reference to a few qualities. Yes. You've made reference to computationally bounded. You've made reference to the timescales over which we process information, say, being very slow compared to, say, the speed of light. That those feel very general to me. 
it's almost hard for me to imagine a non-computationally bounded observer. I'm not sure what that observer would. Now you'd say this, of course, is a limitation of the fact that I am a computationally bounded observer, I presume. But do you yes. envision what a non-computationally bounded observer would be? Well, the yeah, let me give you I mean, is it the universe as, I mean? No, I, I'll give you an example. Yeah. So, you know, in, in this room, there's air. There's a bunch of gas molecules, sure. a large number of gas molecules. They're all bouncing around. They're all essentially computing what they're going to do next. They have these collisions. There's a yeah. little computation going on. For us, there's no way we can imagine following all those gas molecules. Of course. Because we are computationally bounded. If we were not computationally bounded, we would say, I, I've got all those gas molecules. I know what they're going to do. I know that in you know five seconds, all this particular collection of gas molecules that were over here are going to wind up over there. I, I'm, I'm able to. And so then I wouldn't, for example, say, oh, it's just a gas with a certain pressure and so on. I would say, sure. I know my friend, this gas molecule is going to do this particular thing. Right. But, so we, could, a, but we could be computationally bounded and still be able to do that. It's just the bound on our computational processing would have to be much larger than what it currently is. That was the distinction, right? I mean, you well, don't need to be computationally unbounded to do that. You just need to be able to take in a kind of data set that's beyond our capacity. Well, no, but the, you know, you can, and this is where it kind of, it gets mathy, but you know, if you start thinking about as you increase the size of the thing you're looking at, as you increase the amount of time that, that is elapsing and so on, you very quickly get into the situation where if you are of any bounded size, you will blow out your abilities, so to speak. Yeah. And so, so this sure. is the question of whether, so for example, if we look at the, the long future of the universe, you know, one thing people are sometimes kind of disappointed about is, oh, you know, there'll be a heat death in the universe. Eventually, you know, all these processes, all these uh, organized things that are happening in the universe, it's all going to just grind down into random heat, random, you know, uh, sort of motion of molecules that are just completely random. And people say, that's terrible. That's the end of everything that one might care about yeah. in this kind of random soup uh, in the universe. But if you were not computationally bounded, you wouldn't think that. Of course. You would say, every molecule, I know it's where it's going to go. It's got its right? whole history that you can sort of read out from it. Right, right. So that's yeah. an example of what, what it would be like to be not computationally bounded. Sure. You, would, you would have a very different... Uh, you now, I you know a thing that I find very challenging is to think about what it's like to not be like us, so to speak. Yeah. And you know, I've tried, for example, these days with you know we have AIs that um, are well aligned with the way we humans think about things. So you know, I did an experiment recently. You take an AI that's been trained on a few billion images that we humans have put out on the web. And it can generate images. So you say, you know, show me a picture of a cat in a party hat. Yeah. And it will generate something which is sort of typical of what we humans would think of as being a cat in a party hat. You say, okay, that's what that's that's a concept that we humans understand. Now let's move in kind of concept space, which we can do inside this AI. We can yeah. say, let's move in concept space away from the concept of cat in a party hat. Let's move into what I was calling interconcept space the space between the concepts that we humans have named. What's out there? Well, you can have the AI just generate a picture of what's out there. What's out there is something that looks like it's a picture. What does it mean to us? Yeah. Right now, pretty much nothing. It's just some elaborate pattern, some complicated picture. What is it? Well, we can kind of yak about it for a bit, but it doesn't really have a resonance for us. And if we even go beyond that and we say, let's modify the AI, let's change its mind, so to speak, change the way its mind is built, and say, what does it then think a cat in a party hat looks like? You get these weird pictures, which are very non-human. Mm. They're very, they kind of begin to sort of show us a little bit what it's like to be a mind that is not, not quite like a human mind. Yeah. Right. And and it's it's you know, it's for me, it's a it's a great exercise in imagination which I don't think I've sort of succeeded in, in mastering. I, I will say one thing, though, about the sort of interconcept space. You know, one of the things that's really, really interesting about that is even the most basic way of sort of exploring interconcept space. The concepts that we humans have come up with represent one part in a trillion, 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 I have to go on with a, a bunch of trillions there of, of all what's possible. There. Yeah. And, and, and then we ask ourselves, well, will we ever get there? And what we realize is, that's what the progress of science 
and the sort of arc of intellectual history is all about. We are gradually expanding our domain in kind of the space of concepts. We're gradually sort of expanding the paradigms that we think in terms of and so on. It's yeah. a slow process, but that's the that's kind yeah. of the the journey that we can think of as being kind of the journey of science and mathematics and, and these other kinds of areas. Yeah, for sure. Now, look, when I began as a physicist, and I have since changed or shifted or matured, I don't know what the right word is, but when I began life as a physicist, I thought that what I was engaging in was a search for the abstract and objective laws that were kind of out there governing, you know, the formation of stars, the Big Bang, black holes, and things of that sort. And many of my colleagues still speak that way, and they feel deeply that is what the charge of being a physicist or a scientist more generally is all about. I have shifted to a place where it feels much closer to what you're saying. I've shifted to a place where I view what I do and my colleagues and you do as trying to describe in concept space, in the language that makes sense to us as human beings, what's happening out there. I no longer feel like the equations that we write down for general relativity and quantum mechanics are kind of operating out there, which is certainly the prejudice that I had as a younger person. If I understand correctly, you are saying something quite similar, that the goal of what we do as scientists is to find the description that makes sense to us as say these computationally bounded observers with brains that operate on time scales much shorter than the speed of light and so on and so forth to describe what's out there. But do you think that there is an out there that is operating according to some laws, rules, whatever we want to describe it that is at work, of course, we're part of the out there, so I don't mean to sort of juxtapose the two in that way, but is there some fundamental set of rules that's really operating or is it all about finding the set of rules that do a good job at describing your perceptions? Well, so I think there is a thing that's out there. We call it the Ruliad, and it's a weird, very abstract thing. It's not surprising that it's an abstract thing because it's a, sort of a, a very conceptually big thing. What is it? It's it's essentially this object that is the entangled limit of all possible computations. That's a very weird kind of concept, because usually you say, what is a computation? Well, you set up these rules. They might be the rules for the way that the microprocessor in your computer works. You feed in some input. You let the thing go crunch, crunch, crunch for a while, and then you get the output. That's essentially a, a, the process of a single computation. One of the things that we can then ask is, well, let's say we change the rules for the computation. And we do the same thing. We feed in some input, we get some output, we get different things going on. Let's imagine that we could look at what happens with all possible rules, all possible inputs. One of the things is you say, well, how could you ever conclude anything from that? Turns out that thing has a rich structure, not least because two very different inputs and maybe even two very different ways of computing rules for computation can wind up producing the same thing. So mm -hmm. you get this complicated entangled object that is, represents kind of all possible computations running, let's say, even for an infinite time and looking at the sort of entangled structure of all these possible computations. It's a very big abstract thing. One thing about it is there's only one of it. It's unique. It's, it is the case that, in a sense, once you have this idea of describing things according to rules, you inevitably get this object. It is the limit of sort of describing everything in terms of rules. And so it's it's not like you get to say, oh, I'll have Ruliad number one. No, actually, I'll, I'll pick Ruliad number seven instead. There's only one of it. And it's kind of as inevitable as, you know, once you've defined what, you know, two and two are and pluses and so on, it's inevitable that two plus two equals four. It's not a thing where you get to say, you know, might it be that way? Might it be a different way? It has to be the way it is. So, um, so, so, so just so I understand that's, space well enough and perhaps how it relates to things that have been articulated previously. You know, when I was a student of Robert Nozick's philosopher at Harvard, he had this idea that he was developing at the time called the principle of fecundity. You know, it was sort of like all, all realities are out there in some way. I don't know if he framed it precisely enough to draw a relationship, but um, Max Tegmark, you must know from MIT, had this idea of the larger reality being all possible mathematical structures 
they are just out there and we are cognizant of a small slice of it. Is your Ruliad commensurate with those ideas? Who knows? I mean, I know what the Ruliad is and it's a very nice, precise thing. I have to say, I've, I've, you know, it's interesting because one of the things that's happened is, you know, we got to this place by doing computation and physics and science and so on. And we've ended up with these constructs and concepts that are sort of deeply philosophical, almost theological in some ways. And, and in many cases, they sort of, they peel back, you know, the last 300 or so years, it's been kind of, science has been out ahead. But some of the things that we end up talking about are things which, you know, theologians have talked about for, for centuries, but have been yeah. kind of submerged in modern science. So, you know, the thing, the thing about sort of the thing we built with the Ruliad is it's a, it's a, a nice, precise, very well-defined thing. So how it relates to, I mean, people have asked me uh, the, the particular, let's see, I mean, I'm, I, I should keep the inventory of all the things that people ask, is it related to X, Y, Z? Yeah. Because by the time you have this object that purports to be the underlying thing of all possible reality, so to speak, it better be related to a lot of stuff. But right. so, so the answer is, I don't, I don't really have a great, a great way to address that. I think that the, the concept, I mean, the, the thing that, um, uh, the, you know, you're asking kind of what's, is it out there? And one of the things to realize is, and this is kind of a brain twisting kind of thing, as you were alluding to, there's no out there. We're in it. Yeah. It is everything, and we are part of it. So the, the question is really, how does an observer within the Ruliad, made from the same stuff that makes the Ruliad, what does that observer perceive about the Ruliad? And that the answer to the, the fact that there's anything reasonable one can say about that, I consider remarkable. And the point is that with, you know, for an, an arbitrary observer, there's not much you can say. But for an observer with these limitations that we seem to have being the way that we are, there are a bunch of things you can say. And what's really exciting is the things you can say seem to align almost perfectly with the big things that we were able to say in 20th century physics, which is super surprising. I mean, it, yeah. it's not what I thought was going to happen at all. And I think the, uh, you know, th this question about how do you perceive a thing when you're in that thing is a, you know, that's a, that's something where we've sort of been lucky that, that thanks to mathematical physics, basically, we have some of the tools necessary to actually talk about that. We understand things like reference frames from relativity. Mm -hmm. We understand various things about measurement from quantum mechanics. These are the things which are sort of the raw material that gives us a hope of sort of turning what would otherwise be some kind of vague sort of philosophical um, you know, concept into something that we can actually sort of do hard science with. So I'd love to jump in to, to some of the details, but I'm wondering if at the outset we could set expectations, really my expectations perhaps more than anything. I mean, the reason I believe, that's not even the right word, the reason I have confidence in quantum mechanics of course, is I know how to sit down with the basic mathematics and given enough time and computational power, I know how to calculate things like a scattering amplitude or the anomalous dipole moment of the electron, you know, so I can calculate things. And I know that when those calculations are done correctly, they agree to fantastic precision with things that we actually observe in the world. I know how to sit down with general relativity and calculate the bending of starlight by the sun, just to go all the way back to 1919. So where where does your program stand before we get into yeah. the details? Can you calculate like the the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron? No, not that. But what we, you know, so here's, here's where we're at. We can, uh, in the case of, okay, so we've got these three areas, statistical mechanics, general relativity, quantum mechanics. Statistical mechanics is actually the easiest to talk about. Maybe we'll talk about it later. But Which the, one is the one, Statistical mechanics okay. is actually yeah. the easiest to talk about. Mm. It has um, uh, just, but, but in general relativity, for example, uh, we can calculate. So, for example, we have a nice calculation now of the merging of two black holes. And it seems to agree well with the predictions of general relativity. In fact, it seems to agree well enough 
that the method that we have of computing, uh, so, so, so normally, as, as you well know, when you're computing something like merging of two black holes, you're studying kind of the, all these differential equations that represent the kind of curvature of space time and so on. And when you actually do it on a computer, after you probably pre-processed it a bunch with Mathematica, but eventually you try and discretize the space time so that you can put it on a, on a digital computer. Yes. In our methods, and we'll talk about this in more detail, we're starting from the discrete underlying structure of space time, and we're then aggregating up to see what consequences that has on a large scale. And turns out that the thing we've built seems to be a very good way of just computing what happens in general relativity. So, now, for instance, can, could you could you calculate you know the gravitational waves that say LIGO observed say from the first looks like black it. Hole yeah, looks like it. It's very convenient that black holes. Oh yeah, we've got a nice little video there. That that um, yeah, let, we can we can yeah, show this video. Here? Yeah, that's that's what we're seeing. We're seeing two little very very tiny black holes close in size to the elementary length in the universe, and there they merged. And if you sort of analyze this a bit, you'll find there are gravitational waves that came out at that merger. And uh, uh, you know, it's it's looking good in terms of agreeing with what is predicted from general relativity and observed. Do you mean now, like the surface area is non-decreasing of the merged black hole, that sort of agreement? Yes, yes, but also also you can look at the actual ring down uh, and you can look at, and, and it, it seems right. Okay, and it, it's, you know, I think this is something that is now getting much more precisely validated because people actually want to use our models uh, as a scheme for doing numerical relativity. I mean, it's kind of funny because the people who say this is a good scheme for doing numerical relativity, and for them, if it disagrees with numerical rel with with standard relativity, it's like, oh, that's a really bad thing. For us, that's really exciting because it gives us a, a kind of a, 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 a sort of a crack through which to see kind of things like the discreteness of space. So, in the case of general relativity, we're in, I think, pretty good shape. We have good agreement with what you would expect from in the domains where you expect agreement with general relativity. And we have a lot of weird effects, which we haven't yet been able to compute uh, quite what their magnitude should be, quite how they work. They depend on one parameter whose value we don't know, but we have a bunch of a bunch of funky things. We'll talk about it. Things like dimension fluctuations in the universe. The universe before we go being... there, just so on that, on the image that you showed, yeah. You, you mentioned that the size of the black holes was on par with the elementary size of, so these are tiny black holes. The tiny black holes. What, what, so what sets the scale in, like in, in just again for the audience, you know, in general relativity, you know, we have various numbers that come in, Newton's constant, if we're including the speed of light, that's a useful number to come in. If we're doing something that has quantum aspects to it, we bring in H bar from quantum mechanics. We put those together and we can get a fundamental length scale called the Planck length, about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, a fundamental energy scale, the Planck mass, about 10 to the 19 times the mass of a proton, a fundamental time scale, about you know, 10 to the minus 43 seconds of Planck time. So, so like where does any of, of that come in to to well, I mean approach? that that all comes in. I mean, we, we, we probably, let me, let me give a little bit the status report because you yep. asked for that. And then let's get into explaining sure. how the model actually works. Cause I think it's, it's some, um, so, you know, general relativity, nice check mark. We, we really have, you know, we can really see how things align with general relativity. And but with those tiny things. black holes, like do they Hawking radiate? Uh, that's a good question. We are, we are just working on that. It's looking very promising. It's, but but now you're asking, and again, I have to explain a bunch more because what sure. you saw there was a classical picture. Yeah. Right? We actually have the sort of full quantum version, but it is, you know, for the universe, that's the computation the universe does. For us, it's very difficult to do that computation. It's a lot of computation. But yes, in our models, there absolutely is the, I mean, we can't yet say we get the, you know, Hawking temperature and all that kind of thing. Um, it is pretty promising that we get ER equals EPR, which which we can explain what what that all is. Um, it's it's very clear kind of how the ADS CFT correspondence works in our models, things like that. Um, again, you know, technical stuff we, we can get to it. How about but, the singularity? Yeah. How about the black hole singularity? Do, does you do you get any insight into that? Yes, I mean, well, we should we should we're going okay, into this because uh, I mean the, the 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 you know because we have discrete space time. 
the world of singularities is a bit different than it is in yeah. continuous space time. Sure. And so, for example, topology change is very easy in a discrete space time, and we absolutely sure. see that. So, um, but but let's you know just in terms of where we're at. Okay? Yeah. So, um, sort of general relativity, pretty good shape. Uh, quantum mechanics, we can do a good job of reproducing sort of standard quantum information, quantum circuits type quantum mechanics. And in fact, you can even take a quantum circuit and you can compile it into our models, do computations at that level, and actually you get somewhat better, more efficient ways to optimize quantum circuits than we've had before. So that's that works okay. Quantum field theory. But wait, can you do particle in a box? I'm just wondering. I mean, can you do the basic? Well, okay. Yeah. So the one thing I kind of alighted there, particles are tough for us. Mm -hmm. We don't yet know, and we'll explain how this works, but but kind of particles for us are like if you had a fluid like water or something, you can have a little eddy on the surface of the water. And those are kind of like what we think particles are in our models. And figuring out what the spectrum of particles like electrons and photons and quarks and so on is in our models. No, we have not been able to do that yet. We, we know the path to do that, but it is technically complicated and we're just working up to it. Um, I think that the, I mean, one of the things that's amazing about these models is usually you make a model for something, you kind of compare it with experimental data, you say, oh, whoops, that piece of the model doesn't quite work. Let me tweak the model to fix that and so on. We're now at you know three and a half years out, and we are at zero tweaks. That is, there's not a single thing where we've said, "Oops, you know the model doesn't agree with this. Let's change the model." It is very hard work to go from the underlying model to the actual observable characteristics of physics. But the thing that's just amazing, as far as I'm concerned, is that, as I say, we're at zero tweaks. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no, oh, whoops, you know, the thing predicts we have different number of dimensions than we do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's no, I mean, I, having said that, we don't know why the universe is, has, appears to us right now to have three dimensions. We can't derive the number three. Um, or three, or we, three large dimensions, perhaps. What's that? Yeah, three large dimensions, right. And, and we, you know, we can talk about what uh, uh, the, the question of, so, so one of the things that has happened is, a lot of different approaches in mathematical physics, like you know, causal set theory, spin networks, uh, higher dynamical category. triangulations, I presume. Yes, dynamical triangulations. These are all things that we can see are limits of our models. The one that's still out there is string theory, which I'm pretty sure is also a limit of our models. But that just that mathematical physics hasn't been done. It'll be very nice when it is done. And what's really cool about about seeing this correspondence with with existing work in mathematical physics is that. You know, there's a there's a lot that's been achieved there, and so we can just sort of plug in the things that have been achieved and learn more about our models, and also provide interesting foundations for what's been done in other areas of mathematical physics. I mean, like for example, in uh, uh, causal set theory, for example, people just say, "Oh, there are events that happen in different places in space time." And it's always been kind of confusing. Why would relativity work, given that there's sort of these random events at different places yeah. in space time? In our models, there are events at different places in space time but they are kind of algorithmically generated. And the way in which they're generated inevitably gives relativity. So you get to kind of talk about things using the, the sort of machinery of, of causal set theory, but now you've got a foundation that says there isn't this big problem that there used to be, and you can kind of you know, work from there. But, you I know, we, you briefly, you, you were about to say something about quantum field theory. So could you finish that? Yeah, thought? yeah. So, so I mean, the thing that, as I say, we can, uh, the next challenge we're working on right now is doing the same kind of thing for quantum field theory that we've been able to do for general relativity. That is starting from the underlying model and just doing a bunch of computation and being able to reproduce features of quantum field theory. And it's pretty clear what the roadmap for doing that is. It's just technically difficult. Can I ask you a now, quick question on that? And again, I, we're going a little nonlinear here, but that's fine. Our audience is used to that. To me, quantum mechanics is quantum field theory in zero plus one dimensions. And quantum field theory, as you normally describe it, is therefore just quantum mechanics in say, a signature n comma one reality, yeah. you know, in n plus one dimensions. Why would it be, you know, from Why what I it? understand that you're gonna describe, dimensionality is so fluid in your approach. I would have thought that going from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory is like no no problem at all. Okay, so here's what happens, and, and we're now, we are, Definitely jumping around here. There's a there, when we think about quantum mechanics, 
we're thinking about these many possible paths of history. And that's kind of the, the defining feature of quantum mechanics is yeah. it's not that definite things happen, it's that there are many paths of history and we just get to observe certain aggregates of those paths of history. So in our models, the, the simplest case that corresponds to, to sort of minimal sort of quantum information style quantum mechanics looks at those different paths of history and just says, take the whole universe and say, there's this path of history for the whole universe, take the whole universe, these kinds of things. Okay, that That is a very wasteful way to represent things, and it doesn't deal with the spatial degrees of freedom of what's going on. If you try and do that sort of more less wastefully and you say, no, I don't just want to say there's a whole you know, complete state of the universe and it branches to another complete state of the universe, but you want to get inside there and say, well, actually, it's just this little tiny piece of the universe that's different between these two branches. And you're dealing with space, which is the thing that, you know, so what's happening is most of space is unchanged. There's just this tiny part of space that's changed. It's just technically more difficult to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so that's why there's a distinction between kind of quantum mechanics in the sort of quantum information style of doing quantum mechanics and this you know, quantum field theory where there is a, a spatial extent that one has to deal with and one actually is talking about you know, scattering processes and particles that are moving. I mean, for example, in our models, we maybe come to this, the, the idea that motion is possible is non-trivial. In other words, the fact that you can take a thing and move it to somewhere else and it's still the same thing yeah. is not obvious. Right. I mean, in, in, right. You know, in, in traditional general relativity, if you're close to a space-time singularity, you know any material thing that you try and move there is going to get shredded, and it's probably not the same thing. Right. But, so, but but in our models, the possibility of motion is something you have to derive, and and so we can derive it for things like black holes. We need to find out for what other things we can define it, and those other things for which we can define it, those are particles basically, because particles are the are the carrier carriers of identity that survive under through time and through space, right? Um, and that's uh, but but you know finding what those are is is just you know technically difficult. So, so so can you take us back now more to the beginning? And this is sort of a good summary, chaotic though it may have been because of my random questions, and I apologize for that. But if we take a step back now, where does it begin? I've I've done a little bit of reading, but no doubt yeah. I am incompletely read in on the subject. But it, presumably, it begins with just some collection of nodes, and well, you have let's an talk updating rule. Yeah, go right. ahead. What what is you know what's the universe made of, so to speak? Yeah, and you know the that's been a thing people have discussed since antiquity. And you know, is it made of discrete atoms? Is it a continuous thing? They, that was something much debated, right? What what a, what is matter made of? Yeah. Okay, we discovered you know 100 and something years ago, it's made of discrete molecules. We definitively know that. Light, same way, you know, we can think of it as made of photons. Space, on the other hand, we have tended to assume is continuous. We've assumed that space is just this background thing and we can put stuff anywhere we want in space. Kind of the starting point for our models is space is not just this background thing. Space is actually made of stuff. And in fact, everything in the universe we can think of as being features of space. And so, in, in fact, the, 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 the way that that there are many equivalent ways to think about this because it's a deeply abstract thing. But the way that I think is most kind of, we talked about sort of what is the role of science about sort of, you know, converting what's out there in the world to human understandable narratives. The best one I know for explaining this is, is the following, to just say what space is made of is kind of these discrete atoms of space, which are things where the only thing you can say about them is they have an identity. They're, they they are distinct from each other. And then the other thing you can say is how those atoms of space are related to each other. So in other words, we can say this atom of space is related to these two other atoms of space. What do we get when we have this whole big collection of relations? We can represent that as a, as a graph where we're saying it's kind of like a friend network. What's the friend network of the atoms of space, so to speak? And maybe in our universe today, there might be 10 to the 400 atoms of space. We're not sure. But but it's a very large number. You're talking so, about in uh, the observable in the observable universe, presumably. In the observable universe, yeah. and the, the full Rouillard is much bigger than that. Yeah. Um. The the universe as we've sliced it, and so on. Um. But uh, but then this. Uh, so so we've got this giant network that uh, has some 
you know, these these atoms of space related in these ways. And so then the and that's kind of what we think everything in the universe is made of. And so, for example, particles are these, well, black holes, for example, are particular regions that have certain characteristics that correspond to the way the black holes work. Particles are these things that are kind of like topologically knotted up pieces of that network, we think, that have some kind of you know, continued identity. So th that's kind of the idea of that's, what's, that's what the universe is made of. It's kind of interesting to me as a historical matter that back, you know, beginning of the 20th century, many people had the belief that space was discrete. In fact, I, I keep on discovering that sure. many of those famous physicists that uh, we both know about, you know, I keep on discovering, you know, Heisenberg thought that space was discrete, Bohr thought that space was discrete, Einstein thought that space was discrete. It was um, 1916, Einstein has this nice letter where he says, in the end, it will turn out that space is discrete. Really? But we don't yet have the tools necessary to see how that works. Huh. So I mean, I would understand later. it well for, for all the other luminaries that you made reference to because the discreteness of reality was emerging with a vengeance through the studies in quantum mechanics. I Einstein, too, with photoelectric effect, you know, the discrete nature yeah, right. of light. But I had no idea that he yeah. actually thought that when it came to space time. Yes. I'd love to see that. So yeah, let, yeah, no. offline, I'll get the reference. Yeah, yeah right. No, it's it's a, um, uh, but, but so, you know, and what happened at the time was nobody could get kind of their discrete models of space to agree with relativity. Yeah. And um, it was, you know, and I'm not surprised, given what we now know, it, it required a, a, another few layers of kind of paradigmatic thinking, so to speak, to be able to get something where that was not difficult to achieve. But, but so, okay, so in our models, sort of what's there in the universe is this giant network that represents kind of the state of the universe, the state of space, everything in the, in, in, in the universe is a feature of space. So then the question is, what about time? And, you know, right. one of the things that was sort of the, uh, you know, people have tended to say is, oh, space and time are the same kind of thing. I don't think Einstein actually thought that so much. Minkowski was the was the but he bought into Minkowski's view pretty pretty quickly and pretty fully. Right, right. Minkowski though was the one who was like, yes. we can make this space-time object and it has very nice mathematical properties and so on. Yeah. But but so I don't think space and time are anything like the same kind of thing. I think they're very different kinds of things. I think time we can think of as sort of the inexorable progress of computation. So time is this thing where we're applying the rules and we keep on applying and we keep on applying them, that successive application of rules, that is the pro progress of time. And so in, in the case of these models, what happens is you've got this giant network and you have these rules that say, if you have a little piece of network that looks like this, rewrite it to a piece of network that looks like that. You just keep doing that over and over again. And time is defined by those progressive rewritings. Now, that the, 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 so then the question is, when you do that for a very big network, and you do that for a very long period of time, many, many rewritings, what is the, the aggregate? What, what do you see in aggregate? I mean, it's kind of like asking, you know, these molecules are bouncing around at a microscopic scale. What will be the large scale sort of behavior of the system? And yeah. we know in the case of molecules bouncing around, oh, it's fluids like water and so on. That's what you get from this sort of large scale structure. So the question is, what do you get from this graph? It's actually a hypergraph we tend to use. Um, and you know these rewrite rules and so on. What do you get? What's the large scale limit? Well, with various footnotes that we can talk about, the answer is the large scale limit is Einstein's equations for space time. And, so, and are you talking about the vacuum equations? No, or no, it's the, it's the full equations, but, but you have to say what, so, okay. So the, the, just to fill that in. So, I mean, remember I'm saying everything in the universe is made of space. So when we get energy, for example, and matter, they are just features of space. And we have to characterize what it means to have a piece of space that is representing matter and energy and mass and so on. And it turns out, and this is something that really surprised me, that energy turns out to be basically the density of updates happening in this network. I mean, there's a slightly more formal definition that's a flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces. But basically, it's the amount of updating that's happening in the network that characterizes the, the density of energy associated with that part of the network. And so then, 
then we ask questions like, okay, here's, here's an example of something that you could ask, is you say, let's, let's talk about gravity. How does gravity work? Well, so, you know, we can talk about if in the absence of gravity, uh, you know, things move on shortest paths. So, you know, we have GD6, shortest paths from here to there. In a graph, it's pretty easy to define what a shortest path is because it's sure. just from every node, you just have an edge, you follow that until you get to some other edge. So you have this, this shortest path. Now you ask in this model, what happens when there's a bunch of activity in the network? And it turns out that that de deflects shortest paths. The JD6 are changed by this activity in the network. And the way they're changed is exactly according to the Einstein equations, according to standard laws of gravity. And that's so. So, in other words, disabuse, can you disabuse me of a couple of worries that immediately yes. come to mind? So, worry number one is again, you know, we'll talk at various levels of sophistication. So, I hope the audience will bear with us. But, you know, in general relativity, as many in the audience know, we describe space time continuously as some manifold on which there's a distance function, so called a metric. Yep. And usually, as we describe it, we try to solve the Einstein equations to figure out what the metric is, the distance function yep. on that space. But of course, we could always say that any metric is a solution to the Einstein's equation, simply by defining the right-hand side to be what comes out of the Einstein tensor for the given metric that you put in. So trivially, any metric is a solution to the Einstein's equation from that perspective. The only time it becomes non-trivial is if you have an independent definition of the left-hand side and the right-hand side. But if everything for you is a feature of space-time, do you have an independent definition on the left and the right-hand side, or is it just well, tautology? Right. So, so the fact that I'm describing what energy is, is that independence, so to speak. And also the fact that, for example, in that black hole simulation, those are vacuum solutions to the Einstein equations. There is no separate kind of, you know, separate place where we're identifying I mean, you know, where, subject, we're, we're, subject to particular boundary conditions. Exactly. But, yes. Right. Yes. That had to be set up with with very particular boundary conditions. But I mean, just to just to give some kind of sketch of how things emerge. So we've got this giant network. And the question is, how do you extract from that something that seems like continuous space? OK, so first thing you have to do is this network. It just says how all the atoms of space are related. It doesn't, for example, tell you like where the atoms of space are. There's no where yet. And so first thing you have to do is start defining, you know, what is the effective dimension of the space that this represents? So you can do that by saying, start at a particular position in this network, go to all the nodes that are distance one from that in terms of just following one edge in the graph. Oh, and calculate the volume or something of the sphere. Calculate the, the volume of the GD6 ball, the volume of what you get to if you go R steps. Right. And as that grows, if, if the leading term is R to the power D, then you can identify D as the dimension. Right. Okay, then you look at the subleading term, and there's a correction to the R to the D growth, and that correction is proportional to the Ricci scalar curvature. So that's that's telling you that that correction tells you the you know a, a measure of the curvature of space. Right. And so by doing things like that, you can kind of see how to tease out from this ultimately very discrete structure. You can kind of tease out kind of the the, the standard continuum things, and you get to the the um, you know the the Ricci tensor, for example, comes out in a nice way. It's again a little bit more tricky because you're dealing with the space-time Ricci tensor. You're dealing with these light cones that you have to construct yeah. in this kind of space as a function of time and so on. So it's it's you know there's some technical now. Just to explain the technical complexity of this is when you talk about a manifold, a manifold is kind of a representation of geometry where you look microscopically, microscopically, microscopically. It's just geometry in the way that Euclid defined geometry. It's Euclidean uh, space. In our case, we look microscopically, microscopically, there's just a hypergraph down there. There's right. no underlying Euclidean-like space. And so we kind of have to build our own new version of geometry. We're calling it for now infrageometry, where we start from this, this underlying structure and we have to build up the features of differential geometry from that. And we're, we're, we're sort of midway through doing a fairly rigorous kind of development of kind of what is 
you know, what, what is geometry like when it isn't based on a manifold, right. based on Euclidean space? And by the way, that answers questions like, what is the curvature tensor like in three and a half dimensional space? Mm -hmm. Nobody, there is no literature. I, I, I'd be thrilled if you tell me there's literature on this. We found no literature on the subject. I mean, this is this is not a thing people have ever, you know, had had reason or ability to explore. Yeah, that's I mean, what we, can we, have to analytic, we can analytically continue, you know, sometimes you need to do that when yes. certain integrals are not well defined, but I don't think we've ever really grappled. No, I mean, with, in, yeah. in quantum field theory, uh, you know, yeah. we, we do a little bit of dimensional, you know, four minus epsilon dimensions and so on. Yeah. But uh, uh, but in the in the case of differential geometry, that's not what's been explored. And here's worry number two, if you don't, if you don't. Yeah, please right. go ahead. Um, so Einstein famously spent 10 years writing down or figuring out what ultimately are the Einstein field equations that he famously gave the world in November of 1915. When we look back on what Einstein wrote down, with hindsight, of course, it's kind of pretty obvious that it had to be once once you're dealing with curvature and once you're dealing with energy momentum as described by this particular symmetric two tensor, there aren't that many things that you can put on the left-hand side. So in fact, you could put them all there and just label them by the number of derivatives that they have, keep the ones with the lowest number of derivatives, then just impose some conservation equation. And pretty much that gets you to the Einstein equation. So what worries me is getting those equations out perhaps is less impressive to me than it should be. And maybe you can get me to the point of being really impressed because there's not much that it could have been because presumably you're going for the lowest order piece. We could talk about higher order corrections as well. Absolutely. But there's not much that it could have been besides R mu nu minus half G mu nu R on the left-hand side. Yeah, you're right. The, the thing that we didn't know is how to go from something lower level to that. In other words, it's just like saying you look at the fluid equations for, you know, how a bunch of gas molecules or, uh, you know, liquid molecules or something, what the aggregate behavior of those things is. In, in that case also, there's not much else it could be. The Navier-Stokes equations are sort of inevitable given, yeah. given certain characteristics. But in that case, it was a non-trivial thing. Even given the Navier-Stokes equations, they were known long before we knew that molecules existed. But knowing that What's underneath there is a bunch of molecules bouncing around. That's the thing that's worth knowing. And, and that's, 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 you're right that for me also, the Einstein equations seem obvious. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, um, and, and in fact, the same is true of quantum mechanics. In our models, quantum mechanics seems obvious as well. But the fact is that, that the, uh, you know, the fact that it, it's been possible to derive this mm -hmm. from something First of all, lower level, just this kind of discrete machine code, and more extremely than that, this Rouliard object that is kind of a necessary thing, the fact that it's possible to derive these things from that, that to me is rather remarkable. Yeah. And, and let me, just to fill in a little bit about, sure. about sort of how to think about this, let's talk about you know, the, the thing that I said was gonna be the easiest one of the three big theories of 20th century physics, namely statistical mechanics. Okay. So. So, you know, the big result of statistical mechanics is the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy increase. The, the rule that says, the law that says, if you start systems off in a kind of orderly state, they will tend to degrade to disorder. Or they, they will, you know, if you have a bunch of molecules and they're all going in the same direction and kind of doing mechanical work, pushing in the same direction, chances are things will randomize and it will turn into heat. Yeah. And, and that's, so that's been, that's the second law. And people have wondered, could you derive the second law? In fact, Einstein, interestingly, something I, I just learned, you may have known this for a long time. In 1905, Einstein wrote these three amazing papers that established you know, relativity, quantum mechanics, and Brownian motion. Yeah. Um, the, uh, and the, the, papers, size of, the size of Adam's model. But, but, so it's really four. I like to count the fourth one. But anyway, go ahead. The, OK, that, that's interesting. Okay, the question is, what were the papers that Einstein wrote in the three years leading up to that time in 1905? The answer is, Einstein wrote papers trying to prove the second law of thermodynamics, hmm. and the papers were wrong. They were, they were philosophically interesting. They very much followed Boltzmann, um, yeah. uh, the, right. who had been kind of the person who was originally pushing the idea of sort of molecular theory of gases, 
early derivations of the second law and so on. Yeah. And Einstein sort of thought he could derive the second law. He didn't succeed. He used the same kind of almost philosophical approaches to science and applied them in these other areas and, you know, amazing results, so to speak. That's just a footnote to history. Sure. Yeah. But, but um, you know, people believed that the second law would be derivable. That is, if you knew the mechanics of the molecules, that would it would be inevitable that you would get this tendency towards randomization. It's very confusing. Like Boltzmann, for example, had his uh, H theorem. H theorem, for sure. That, that, yeah. that said, oh, well, if you have these molecules bouncing around, this quantity H, which is well basically the entropy, will increase with time. Well, H will decrease with time. The entropy will increase with time. But but the problem is- But he is put that, in the input, the output, if we look at it more closely. Of yes. Yeah. yeah, right, exactly. I mean, the, the, you know, the thing that's mysterious about this is that if you look at the individual collisions of molecules, they time are reversible, reversible in time. Yeah. There's nothing, you know, you look at the little movie of the of the billiard balls bouncing, you could run Can't it backwards, tell. you wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. Right? But in aggregate, when you look at all those gas molecules, you absolutely can tell things go from orderly initial states to disordered final states. Yeah. And and the question is, why do we believe that? And and the answer is because we are observers of the kind we are. And and here's how to think about it, I think. That is because we are computationally bounded observers, even though there is, in principle, you know, we, we can think of it as sort of an encryption process. We start off with a simple initial condition, then we're doing all this computation, and that's grinding up that initial condition into something that looks to us encrypted and random. Mm -hmm. If we were sufficiently computationally sophisticated, we'd be able to say, hey, I understand what that is. I can just reverse it and see that it came from that simple initial condition. But because we're computationally bounded, we don't get to do that. And so, in fact, the, the phenomenon of the second law is a consequence of a very computational kind of thing. It's a consequence. OK, so th th there's one more piece that I have to explain. But, be is, but before you get to that detail, and I hope I'm not throwing you off track, but there is something that's confusing about what you just said. Maybe you can clarify it in half a second. So I agree with you that this being that did not suffer from the limitations that we have would see all the molecules and all the trajectories and be able to immediately reverse it and recognize where it came from and so on and so forth. But that being would also have the capacity to say, hey, there is a more useful way to think about this too. I'm not going to erase my capacity to see all the molecules and their trajectories, but coarse graining seems to be a useful tool for me to use so that I can have a language that talks about the molecules just filling the room as opposed to the trajectory of each individual molecule. And for some discourse, it's useful to have that approximation, that coarse graining. The being would still be able to do that. They would not necessarily be wedded to the level of detail that would put the second law of thermodynamics out of business. That's true. But they, the, you know, the issue, and this, is, this relates to kind of the, 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 the march of paradigms, so to speak. There are things that we would now say Oh, it's obvious you described this aspect of the world this way, but you know, looked at with different instruments, you know, looked at without a telescope, looked at without whatever, we would just describe the world differently. Yes. And you know, I think that that the the saying that, oh yes, you could aggregate this and say, oh, well, it's just roughly this going on, the the computationally unbounded being might say, Why would you want to do that? I can figure out everything. Why would I need to Look at this aggregate thing. That's irrelevant. I mean, it's, it's kind of like there are plenty of situations where, you know, as we've, you know, in the practical world where we get more and more data about things, one might have said, oh, I don't know, take some, some medical, you know, finding. You know, you might have said, oh, you know, you look pale today. Well, okay, that we can convert that in modern times to this is the precise metabolomics that we can measure of this and that and the other. Yeah. And you know, and and then the oh, you look pale today. It doesn't seem like the most relevant thing to say, so to speak. And so I, I think it's it's hard to project. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. There's nothing that would prevent sort of an entity that can do this unbounded computation from deciding to aggregate things in that way. Uh, on the other hand, it's it's you know it's a it's a the fact that we are led to aggregate things in the way that we do is a consequence of the way that we are. For sure, but but, but you know, I, I should explain one one other very important piece, which is this phenomenon I call computational irreducibility, which is something that I I mean I started figuring out in the in the early 1980s actually, and it's, it's the following thing. So so one of the kind of 
sort of ideas that one gets from mathematical physics is once you've got the equation, you've solved the problem, more or less. Right. I mean, that is that the equation, it's like I've got it now, and I can work out every consequence from that. When you're in the computational world, that's no longer true in the same sense. You've got some rules, you start running the rules. And you're saying because to run the rules will take so long that you can't do it any right. faster than running the rules. Right, right. And so this, this, this fact that you can't jump ahead and say, and the answer is going to be X, you have to just run every step and see what happens. That's kind of a, a new feature of the computational world, a little different than we'd ever understood in the mathematical world. I mean, by the way, it's not like people hadn't intuitively understood this. I mean, you know, Newton, for example, famously said, you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, when, when you're talking about many planets in the solar system, you know, he says he's now got the equations, but to work out the motion of all these planets is, I think he said, if I'm not mistaken, beyond the, the capability of any human mind. He thought God could do it, but no human mind could do it. Mm -hmm. So he already had this idea of kind of the, the sort of irreducible computational difficulty of working out the consequences of things. But we see that much more extremely in these computational settings. And that's, by the way, that's sort of the, that's what time, that's the sort of hard aspect of time, so to speak, that time, the passage of time means something because it is an irreducible computation. You know, we, we get to live our lives and do all the things we do, and we can't just jump ahead and say, and the answer is going to be 47 or something. Um, we have to kind of live the time to, uh, it, it, it means something to live the time, so to speak. So, so we can it, lack free will, but we can never predict what we're gonna do. So it yes. all works out. Yes, exactly so, right. Uh, I think, but, but so, so the, the you know, in, in this case of, of, of uh, the second law, the thing that's very critical is this underlying computational irreducibility. If it wasn't for the fact that it is difficult to do that decryption of what happened. If that was still easy, then there wouldn't be any, we wouldn't say, oh, it looks random. We would just say, oh, it's obvious, you know, I can, I can see it's this. So it's this interplay between the computational irreducibility of what's going on underneath and our computational limitations in our ability to observe things. And that's what, that's what kind of gives us, in this case, the second law. Now, you know, once you've understood those principles, it's kind of obvious the second law has to work. Right. Um, but before you understand those things, I mean, if you read, I, I spent a bunch of effort really untangling the history of the second law and, and the incredible confusions that, that developed because yeah. people didn't understand these kind of essentially computational principles because they were 100 years too early to understand those things. And yes, you know, the thing that's great and, and always, you know, very encouraging when you have some model and you figure things out and so on, if you can go back at the end and say that was obvious, that's a huge win. Right. You know, if, if you say um, no, you know, you have to, you know, pile all these stones up in just exactly this way, and then eventually you get this big tower. That's much less satisfying than if you say, well, I should have been able to see that long ago. Sure. And that's kind of more the situation we're in now. Now, having said that, the you know, when you ask about like what are the experimental implications and so on, figuring out. You know, what is the dimension fluctuation, do the consequence of uh, dimension fluctuations? That's a bunch of just difficult physics work. So let me give you an example of how that works. So in our models, probably the universe started infinite dimensional. And gradually, it kind of cooled down to be effectively three-dimensional. It's as if we had this initial network where everything was connected to everything. And then gradually, it got to be more like three dimensions where, you know, there's, it's, it, things can be far apart, so to speak. But when you say early, just kind of get, get a feel here, do you envision early on there's like a primordial node or is there some primordial configuration? How does it begin? Oh, uh, yes. Well, that's a, that's a fun thing in the, in the life of the Ruliad because um, uh, it's, okay, so if we, okay, there's a, the Ruliad, in a sense, has no beginning, but in a sense, it is, you have to talk about it. The object itself is just, uh, what can I say? It's kind of like a circle. Where's the beginning of the circle? It's like, well, if we are actually going to draw the circle on a piece of paper, then there's a beginning to it. But conceptually, there's no beginning to it. 
Yeah. It's it's just is. And it's the same thing here. And when we uh, a thing to understand about this is that that we are as as we are observers in, embedded in this Ruliad, we can be at different positions in the Ruliad. So l- let's talk about that in terms of ordinary space. So we have physical space and we have a certain view about what's happening in the universe. Our view of what's happening in the universe depends on where we are. You know, we're on this planet in this galaxy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we were somewhere else, we have it would have a different view of what's going on. Now, more abstractly, in the Ruliad, we, a mind, so to speak, is at some place in the Ruliad. Different minds are, in effect, at different places in the Ruliad. Different minds attribute, in a sense, different sets of rules to what happened in the universe. There is a notion of motion in the Ruliad, just like there's motion in physical space, just like as we move to a different place, we're still the same us. There is a similar kind of concept of motion in the Ruliad that we can say, There is this entity, and there's another entity nearby, and these two entities will have sort of corresponding views of what's happening. Um, You know, when we talk about sort of alien intelligences, we can think about that as more distant things than the Ruliad. It's like all humans are clumped in this little, little, just as we are clumped on this little planet, so to speak. We're also clumped in a small region of the Ruliad. All our minds are concentrated in this small region of the Ruliad. As we go to, you know, your cat or dog or something, it's a little bit further away. As we go to the weather, for example, it's much further away. And sort of communicating across the Ruliad, translating from one place in Rulial space to another is not so easy. And so that's why kind of it, it you know, there's not good alignment between these different things. Yeah. But but I think in in uh uh Let's see, you were asking about sort of the beginning of things. Yeah, phys- and, so uh, if we stick to physical space for mm-hmm. a moment, can you describe to us uh-huh. how in your approach a space resembling ours can be built up? And I and I saw some animation that you had that may assist in giving people- Yeah, yeah, right. Content. We can look at, let's see, what was this? This was uh, number one there. We can try. So tell us what we're seeing here. Okay, so this is just- a possible beginning of our universe. So if we if we start it again at the very beginning, we'll, we'll, it'll start off from just one node. And it'll keep on being rewritten, and building up new nodes and new nodes and so on. And this is, you know, a ridiculously small amount of effectively time at the beginning of the universe. So to speak. And there's a very simple rule for starting with a node yes. and what to do next. Exactly. And you keep going long enough and you will get even with this particular rule, you'll get something which has kind of the 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 in aggregate seems like continuous space. Just like if we had enough molecules bouncing around, it would seem like a continuous fluid. And so, and in, and, and in here, you can apply your technique for working out the dimensionality of the exactly. space. Like you're saying, you right. started to give a node. Consider all the one edge motions or two edge motions, look at the volume of the space that you fill out, and in that way get some notion of dimensionality. Right. And so in this particular case, the answer is about 2.6. And, and so, so do you do you imagine, you know, I don't even know if this is the right language in the approach you're taking, but if we think about the Big Bang, yep. does it start with a node? I mean, like what you what can okay, so with? so you can this is why I was starting to explain about, about different places in real space and so okay. on. There is, uh, in, in standard relativity, we're talking about different reference frames, different ways to slice what counts as space, what counts as time, and so on. Yes. Same story in real space. So you can, it, it's the same kind of thing. There is a view of the universe in which it starts with one node. Um, and that view of the universe may be a useful view of the universe for a mind okay. of a particular kind. Right. It's it's not the only possible view of the universe. But right. That's a possible. That is one reference frame, essentially one real reference frame. That is the coordinatization of the universe in that particular uh, in that particular way of of sort of foliating real space. That particular way of of picking reference frames. And so so that's a, a reasonable. I think it's a reasonable way to start talking about things. It's not the only possible way. Just like in relativity, you know, you could you could pick a different coordinate system and so on, and you would have a different kind of narrative description of what's going on, even though in an underlying sense it's the same stuff going on. So it's now, a, it's a little bit slippery yeah. that way. But. Now it seems again, 
I have to admit I'm fairly naive on the questions I'm asking. So if you want to even correct my questions, I'm perfectly fine with that. But it would seem from the picture that you showed us, the animation that you showed us, that the notion of expanding space seems fairly visible and intuitive. Yes. Is, is is that a reasonable way of, of, of articulating in some gross continuous geometry sense what we're seeing happening? I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I've been wondering about that sort of the expansion of space and, and how to think about that. And it, it certainly echoes for me, you know, Einstein famously, you know, had written down his equations and said, oh my gosh, these equations imply that the universe expands. I better add this, you know, cosmological term as a correction to prevent that happening. But actually the universe does expand. And, you know, I have to say in, in, in what, in what we've got, the, the obvious conclusion is the universe expands because there are more nodes getting made. But there's right. a more bizarre possible thing that's going on, which is that, that as time goes on, you're generating more and more nodes, and the universe is in a sense getting finer and finer. You, you, the, our length scale is fixed, but the universe is getting finer and finer. And in fact, one of the more bizarre possibilities, when you ask, is the universe discrete or continuous, for example, one of the more bizarre possibilities, which we can't yet exclude, is that if you say, okay, I'm going to measure, I'm going to measure the elementary length, and I'm going to take a certain amount of time to measure the elementary length, it could be that by the time you've done that measurement, the universe has subdivided itself to the point where that measurement no longer makes sense. So that's that's so we don't I, I don't think we fully understand yet what the you know the notion of the expansion of space and so on. So just to be a little bit more technical. One of the things we've been very interested in, you know, in standard relativity and cosmology and so on, there's, you know, the Robertson Walker, Friedman Robertson Walker, whatever. Sure. The more names have been added to that since I since I first started studying. Lemaitre, Lemaitre deserves a place in that list. I, I, I know he has a good history, right? Yeah. But um, anyway, so so the the um, uh, in any case, that that's kind of a, a an aggregate description of the universe, which just says the universe is roughly this big. And we're not going to. We're going to assume that everything about the universe is otherwise homogeneous. We would really like to extend that to include dimension as a dynamical parameter, in addition to curvature, uh, size of the universe. We want to include dimension, and I think we will understand a lot more about how this works when we have that kind of aggregate dimension changing equation for the sort of aggregate evolution of the universe. So I'm, I'm, but presumably your 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 dimension changing quality settles down pretty quickly. Otherwise, it's hard to imagine how we get stars and galaxies, at least in our little corner of this picture. Right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. So one of the things that I am suspecting right now is that the universe is only three dimensional for observers like us, and that, and I don't yet know what attribute, you know, observers like us have all kinds of weird attributes. You know, we assume that we're, you know, we're persistent in time. We assume that we are, in a sense, localized in space. We assume things about free will, for example. We assume all kinds of stuff, which seems so obvious to us that we don't even identify it as an assumption. But it is my guess that some aspect of the way that we exist as observers causes us to parse the universe as three-dimensional. If, I, 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 I think I understand what you're saying, but of course we have all these very precise experimental results in terms of, you know, absolutely. how the gravitational field falls off with distance and, you know, and these are all consistent with, you know, a three-dimensional space, but you would, you would want me to interpret those as something which an observer like me would necessarily measure because of my own constitutional yeah, makeup. Yeah, because you're measuring, you know, in, what are those measurements? Those measurements assume things like, okay, let me let me start taking apart those measurements, okay? You're right. You've got material objects, distinct objects. You think you can put those objects at arbitrary positions from each other. That is an assumption about free will. It's, you know, there's a whole raft of assumptions right. that are being made. And, you know, the experiment you're doing is a highly worthwhile experiment to do, but it's an experiment with all kinds of, stuff that's been put into it. And, you know, so in terms of what we expect for the universe, the, the, you know, we expect that there will be dimension fluctuations. That is that, you know, in aggregate, the universe 
we don't know why it's three, but the universe will appear to observers like us to be three-dimensional. But we would expect that there will be fluctuations. Places left over from the early universe where the universe was about 3.01 dimensional, let's say, and gradually kind of calmed down to being three-dimensional. We don't know why it's three, as I say. But so a big question is how long do the dimension fluctuations last? And we're starting to do simulations to try and figure that out. The obvious thing from a practical physics point of view is that they last until the cosmic microwave background was formed and could we detect them in aspects of the cosmic microwave background? Of course, we don't know the answer to that yet, but it's certainly, an, a, an, and we don't even know what would a dimension fluctuation look like in the cosmic microwave background. I mean, the, the most extreme thing that would be, yeah, this is a good physics question, right? It's, it's, this is where, you know, there's sort of an underlying model, but there's a whole, you know, big tower of actual physics that has to be done to connect it to experimental observations. And I, you know, one of the things that's a cautionary tale, again, from history, you know, if, if the bending of light around the sun from general relativity had been measured in 1616, in 1916, as, as it was originally sort of might have been, Einstein had the wrong results at that point. And it was only later. Oh, you mean, you mean, well, actually, before then. So, you know, 1914, I, I guess, probably, right, when the teams went out to measure the prediction of 1911 or something, that he had the wrong equations. That yes, had they, yes, yes, I think yes. Yes, yes. Had they done the measurement? In fact, those astronomers, they got arrested as they went into Russia. Right. And that's, that's why they had their equipment, you know, confiscated. Right. Right. But you're right. Had they done the measurement, Einstein would have been in the uncomfortable position of crying wolf in 19, yeah, yeah. You know, a little bit later, because his first right. prediction would have been false. Right. But, but so it, it's always, you know, the, the going from an underlying theory to a measurable prediction is yeah. always a challenge. And, I, you know, one of the things that that is a, sort of a, a bizarre possibility is, you know, the phenomenon of gravitational lensing, where, you know, you have a massive thing and you've got you know, light being bent on either side and you can see, you know, you can in, you know, you get these two different images of the same galaxy from different sides of the gravitational lens. Now, the possibility is if there was a fractional dimension of gravitational lens, what might happen is, we don't know if this happens, but it would be cool if it did, that the image of the galaxy is shattered, so to speak, into lots of little sort of uh, fractal pieces. And that if we could get the right transform, we just say to you know our space telescope friends, take this image of the sky, apply this transform to it, and you'll reconstruct those pixels and you'll get images of galaxies. That would be that's kind of the the fantasy version of um, of of what you know how you would detect a dimension fluctuation, and yeah. you know it'll it'll be more difficult than that. Right. But um, that's the type of thing that that we like to be able to figure out. Now, you know, one of the questions that comes up in all of this is, okay, are there lots of parameters? Are there lots of knobs and switches and so on in these models? For our models, there's just one, which is the elementary length. What is that? What is we have two atoms of space and they have a relation between them. What is the translation between that distance defined by that relation and the thing we measure with meter rules and so on? I mean, that it is, sounds very, it sounds very string theoretic in that I way. I mean, I mean, the one parameter that we have, of course, is the, you can frame it in many ways, the string tension, the string length, or the square root of alpha prime, however you want to frame it. But it really is this one, parameter right. that you that you put into the to the story and yeah, for I mean, your particular case i gather you just leave it as a as a as a free parameter well we, we we've tried to estimate it okay so i don't know we have a very hokey estimate is that of, how you got the, your 10 to the 400 that you mentioned early yes, on because yes. that felt to me like i would have said more like 10 to the 200 if i was thinking about plank lengths and plank volumes in the observable yep. universe yeah so our elementary length is certainly significantly smaller than the plank length Right. So it's, you know, more like 10 to the minus 90 meters rather than 10 to the minus 34 meters. But, but why, where, where in the world do you even get that I, notion that it's yeah, smaller okay. so, than the so plank length from? Roughly, the, roughly what happens is in our models, there's a factor that occurs, which is the number of essentially parallel threads of history that exist in the universe. And that number is pretty big. You know, maybe it's 10 to the 120 or something. And essentially that number is you end up dividing the Planck, Planck you know, units by that kind of number. And so, for example, one of the mysteries in, in Planck units is why the Planck energy is so big. You know, the Planck energy is the energy of a lightning bolt or something, which seems very non, 
you know, elementary. I like to think that it's a massive dust moat, but yes, I'm sure they're the, similar in some ways. Right. The, um, but, uh, but so the, um, you know, in our models, the elementary energy is actually very small. And um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, the, this question of how big is the elementary length, the, the elementary length, the elementary time, the elementary energy, they're all related by standard Planck units. Um, so there's really only one parameter. Now, you know, that parameter, it's a question of, are we going to be in luck in having that parameter be something that can be measured in our lifetime, so to speak? You know, when people were talking about molecules, it might have been that theoretically atoms and molecules exist, but, you know, it might not have been the case that there was a phenomenon like Brownian motion that allowed people to say, yes, we can actually see the effects under a microscope of those individual molecules. By the way, Brownian motion was discovered, I think, in the 1830s, long before its interpretation as revealing the fact that it was showing individual molecules was Molecule known. Banging into things, sure. Right, and so, so the real question is right now, for example, can we detect an analog of Brownian motion in space? Right. You know, what, what is the sign of Brownian motion of space? That will be a, the sort of the analog of discreteness of space. And I have a guess, which actually is a, a very new guess. So it's, a, uh, it's still very fresh from, um, um, and it, it's, it, it leads me to a rather bizarre aphorism, which is um, back in the, in the 1800s, when people were studying heat, nobody knew what heat was. And so people invented this idea of caloric fluid, sure. which was, you know, heat must be this fluid Poured that flows. In stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that would be, that would flow from this, this place to that. Yeah. Okay. So now we have a phenomenon, you know, in, in, in gravity, which is things like dark matter. We have this, you know, something that causes gravity, but isn't matter that we can see, at, see what it is, so to speak. And so my, my aphorism is, you know, dark matter is the caloric of our time. And what I mean by that is people uh, say, what could dark matter be? Well, what is matter? Matter is made of particles. Let's go look for particles that make up this dark matter. Just like back in the 1800s, people said, what could heat be? It must be a fluid. Let's go study the properties of this fluid. My guess, my current guess, and this is a this very new guess. So this is like a, this is the first time I've mentioned this guess anywhere other than them. Um, uh, you know, sort of uh, to myself, so to speak, is um, uh, I, my current, my guess, not yet worked out, is that dark matter is the kind of space-time analog of heat. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the structure of space, j just like heat, is really the microscopic motion of molecules, that in a sense, this thing that produces gravity, but is not, does not have the, the characteristics of, of, of standard matter, is a feature of the structure of space. And in particular, when you look at, for example, that simulation of black holes, yeah. what you could see in the background there was the knitting together of the structure of space. That was a bunch of space-time heat. The, the space wouldn't exist were it not for the fact that the atoms of space are all interacting in these ways and so on. That is what makes space. The question is, is there, a, is, is there a, an effective temperature, so to speak, to that, uh, you know, is there is there a sort of an activity level and so on to that? And I think, you know, th this is the question of what are the the effective equations for the the you know for the structure of that kind of space time heat. So this is a this is you're hearing this for the this is a, a very uncooked, even though I'm you know, it's, a, heat, it's, it's a very uncooked idea. You know, it's an interesting idea. I mean, obviously, the one thing I would stress to the audience is that there are indirect signatures that the dark matter plays by the rules of matter, just that it doesn't reflect light or emit light. But I agree, we've been searching for well, dark matter particles for a long time, and we haven't actually been able to find one that we can clap when you say our hands. plays by the rules of matter, what you're saying is that its gravitational effects yes. are, you know, it has gravitational effects. I agree. I mean, and it has inertia and things like that. And, but, and the way that it exerts or doesn't exert pressure seems to comport with our understanding of how ordinary matter exerts or does not exert pressure, for instance. So it's a little bit more than than just that. But but yes, I can't sit here and nobody can say what the dark matter is. But how would you distinguish dark matter and dark energy? Then is dark energy also uh, a feature of the structure of space? Probably. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, again, this is th these are. 
what we have is a is a kind of a you know we have a paradigmatically different way of thinking about space, and knowing what the consequences of that are is not trivial. Um, yeah. And uh, you know I think that one of the things that given for example, that we had a paradigmatically way, different way of thinking about matter, namely that's made of molecules. Then one had ideas like that heat could be microscopic feature of the of motion of molecules and so on. And so similarly, now that we have a different paradigmatic idea about the structure of space, we get to ask all these questions. And and for instance, and you know, the questions that I suppose are the most pressing, as far as I'm concerned, are you know, how do we actually know? How do we know that we know what we're talking about? You know, how do we get uh, sort of, for example, sort of bizarre, completely unexpected phenomena that we go out and look for and they're actually there? And that that's, you know, that that's what that's when you feel really good about theories is when, I mean, to me, what, what's made me feel really good about this theory is that everything just seems to line up. It seems to fall into place. It's like I didn't understand how this worked and now I do. Actually, one thing we should talk about is quantum mechanics. Because yeah, I'd love to get to that, cool but before things. we do, just kind of press you on that point a yeah. little bit. So you showed us an animation a little while ago, starting with you know a very simple structure like a node, and presumably behind the scenes, there was some rule for updating it, take this yep. node and replace it by two nodes that are connected in some way and so forth. So do you have a very specific rule for updating a graph, which is the rule that gives rise to you know features like general relativity on some aggregate scale right. no and that's the that's the whole point in a sense this is what i wondered about it's like okay we're looking for the rule and then one day we might say gosh we got the rule and we hold it up and we say this is the rule for our universe and then the next question is well why did we get this rule and not some other rule and that really confused me for quite a long time until i understood this idea of the ruliad which is the idea that all possible rules are being used and that we are merely seeing a slice of that. Right, and but so, I'm saying we beings, we computationally bounded beings whose processing yes. is so slow compared to the speed of Is there a rule that we beings are somehow focused upon from the language that you're using? Yeah, I mean, there'll be so. I, my guess is there's a class of such rules. So for example, let's do the an analogy in fluid dynamics. Yeah. The equations of fluid dynamics work for water as well as for air, even though the structure of water molecules and, and air molecules is completely different. And um, that that's, it'll, it, it's the same thing here. That there, there are, we, we already know this. I mean, there are many different underlying rules that inevitably for observers like us, have these characteristics. So now, if you ask, you know, depending on what kind of question you ask, if you're asking questions about air and water, there are certain detailed questions you might ask which will distinguish the molecular structure of those two materials. And so similarly here, there's, there's something where, presumably, as we become more precise about what kind of observer we are, we will home in on saying, oh, it's this rule that we're attributing the behavior of the universe to rather than that one. But that's, you know, I. I think what we've what we've observed is that there are, uh, you know, there are at least wide classes of rules that have yeah. this characteristic, just like there are in statistical mechanics, of of leading to sort of the the kind of behavior that we that we expect to see, so to speak. So, for example, the rule for that uh, picture of the of the merging black holes is not the same rule as I used for that other picture. Um, slightly different rule, but it's a sim it's they're both incredibly simple rules. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the one for the black hole merger could have been that same rule, but then we would have had to just, it, as you correctly observe, setting up the initial conditions for that is not trivial, as it isn't trivial for the Einstein equations either. And it's just, you know, the technical difficulty of doing that was made easier by choosing a particular rule to, to look at rather than, rather than that other rule. But again, not to get too far in the weeds, are there particular rules that say give you Einstein's equations plus say a higher order derivative expansion where you maybe have curvature squared or curvature to the fourth terms where other set of rules don't do that. I mean, is it, is, is it that level of precision between eventually? How yeah. Eventually you will get that just as if you look at fluid flow and mm -hmm. you look at, for example, hypersonic flow, eventually you see down to the, the molecules and then it matters what the molecules are like. But so we can't distinguish. So you give, you know, at the level of general relativity, 
we can't distinguish. When we're looking at the higher order corrections, and that, um, uh, you know, by the way, the, 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 the downer about the higher order corrections is the scale that determines their importance is the elementary length. Yes. So when we're looking at, or the elementary energy or whatever else. So if we're looking at something that's 100 orders of magnitude bigger than the elementary length, those effects are pretty small. We have a something of a hope that in critical black holes, black holes, you know, where the where the 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 effective sort of I hate to call it angular momentum because it's it's all it's all such a fake in black holes, the spinning of black holes, but you probably have a better way to explain this. But but the um uh you know the parameter that determines essentially the rotation rate of black holes. Yes. Um the uh you know at the critical uh you know at, at the J equals M critical yes. black hole point. Uh, what happens in our models, which is pretty cute, is the um, uh, essentially a piece of the universe is hanging by a causal thread to other parts of the universe. So if you were to increase above that, you would essentially break off a piece of the universe. Um, and so what, what happens right at that point is that the, the sort of the, the piece of the universe that might break off is attached by only a small number of causal edges. And mm -hmm. so there's the possibility that there will be sort of the effect of discreteness will show up in that case. And for example, uh, sort of uh, lumpiness in the gravitational radiation emitted by black holes in that state, things like this. Um, because one is sort of, it, it's like having a gravitational microscope where you've, you've pulled things apart right to the point where you're kind of seeing down to the underlying structure of space. But again, that these are these are all you know the the, the question of of when and, and and when it comes to effects like that, yes, they absolutely depend on the specific rule that you're using. Um, yeah. But when you're looking at the the overall black hole, you know the merger of two big black holes, it doesn't make any difference. Just as it doesn't make difference in the case of fluid dynamics. Right. Um. So let's turn then, having beaten away at Einstein's equations in general relativity for a while here, if we turn to quantum mechanics. You know, quantum mechanics is, of course, in many ways, a sloppy or messy subject compared to the pristine beauty of the general theory of relativity. It certainly took a lot of hands over many years to put together what ultimately we're going to be celebrating, I guess, 100th anniversary in 2025, 2026. You know, the Schrodinger's equation, Heisenberg's matrix mechanics, wherever you want to date it. But there's a lot in quantum mechanics today that many of us, well, I should say some of us, are not particularly comfortable with. We have the issues of the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. We have the question of the interpretation of quantum mechanics. So are, are, so when, when we talk about quantum mechanics, obviously I'm, I'm so deeply interested to hear your approach, but also maybe at the outset you can tell us, will it give us any insight into the questions that are still furring the brows of quantum mechanicians who think about the foundations of quantum mechanics worldwide. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I feel more comfortable with quantum mechanics. I almost think that I understand quantum mechanics. My friend Dick Feynman, who'd worked on quantum mechanics his whole life, was very fond of saying nobody understands quantum mechanics. Yeah. And uh, I think I am I am getting closer to the point where I can say I actually understand quantum mechanics. So let me let me explain what what sure. I think I understand. I mean, the so you know, we talked about, you know, what's the universe made of? It's made of this, this giant network, and uh, this network is getting updated, and these little rewrites are happening. One of the things that you can ask is, there's a rule that says how to do these rewrites. The question is, is there a unique way that these rewrites can happen, given a particular state of the universe? And the answer is no. There are many possible orderings, many possible different, you can say, I'm going to do this update now, and then I'm going to do this update, I'm going to do that update first, and so on. There are many different orderings for those updatings. Yes. And each of those different orderings defines a different microscopic history for the universe. So in a sense, what you have is you can have a state of the universe, you can have two different possibilities for how you update it. They lead to two different branches of history. Somewhat Less obviously, there can also be something where you have two different states of the universe, and when you rewrite them, they end up being in the same state. So you can have this branching, merging structure mm -hmm. that you get. And we call these things multi-way graphs, 
And actually, it's turned out that after we sort of discovered that they're relevant for physics, we've been finding multi-ray graphs everywhere. And in fact, the, the very fact that they seem to describe some aspects of physics, we've been able to export ideas from physics to a whole bunch of other fields, like metamathematics, like distributed computing, maybe like biology, all kinds of areas. So it's been really interesting to see that this structure of so many things can ha many things can happen. You have branching and merging. I'll give it a very simple example. You play a game like tic tac toe, and you start with a board in a particular state. Now you can make one move, or you can make another move, and you can build up this graph, this game graph of all the possible moves that you can make in tic tac toe. And eventually, you know, somebody wins, somebody loses. But there's this there's this graph, and and sometimes there can be different moves you make which end up with the same state of the board, even though the moves were different. Sure. So it's kind of this, this picture of many branches of time that, that uh, are happening in the universe. And so then the, the question, the idea of quantum mechanics ends up being uh, kind of you're, you're, you're looking at those many branches of history. And when you ask a question like, well, okay, so let, let's, we, can, we can go in different directions in quantum mechanics. But one question is, what is the observer of quantum mechanics? What does the observer do? Well, the thing you have to realize is the observer is embedded in the system. Mm -hmm. So the observer, the observer's mind is also branching and merging. So quantum mechanics becomes this bizarre story of what does a branching and merging mind believe is happening in a branching and merging universe. And this is where this idea that we are persistent in time becomes critical. Because if, if we were just flowing through all those branchings and mergings, we wouldn't have a view that we are, we wouldn't have this idea that we have a definite experience through time. But as soon as we assert ourselves, we're having a definite experience in time, we have to kind of conflate many of these branches of history. And the fact that it is consistent to do that is a non-trivial thing you have to show is the case. And the extent to which we see the effects of there being many branches is essentially the essence of seeing that there are quantum effects. That's kind of a, a very rough picture. I mean, I can't help but jump in, as I suspect many who are watching this would think as well, and, and again, disabuse me. It feels like Everett. It feels like the many worlds of, of quantum mechanics. Is it just I that, or, or is it so. something different? I don't think so. I think the big thing that those guys didn't have was merging. And I think merging is really important. no, no. I'm, no, you can definitely have merging. I mean, if you do, you know, double slit experiments and you're superposing the the distinct trajectories, I, I think merging is definitely part of that story well, too. But, uh, no, I, I think the the well, I don't know. This this I'm always really bad about you know. Okay, so my my way of talking about other people's theories tends to be this. I either really do the history and try and understand in great detail what actually happened, or I think I have nothing to say. And this is a case where I really have not done the history, so I, I don't really know. Sure, the, okay. Uh, but, but my impression is the, the kind of, the popular version of many worlds tends to be kind of our consciousness could flow on one of these possible branches, and it is sort of arbitrary which branch we're on, and that's kind of why we see things probabilistically. That's kind of not the picture in, um, Again, it may not be fruitful to go down this, but I think many Everettians would say that our consciousness itself divides and flows along distinct trajectories. And in some sense, the probabilities, which is a very subtle question, emerge because somehow there's a greater measure, a greater weight placed on our consciousness observing one outcome versus another. Okay, and this so is I think a great deal of controversy in how you define that measure and you know, how, how to really operationally make sense of probabilities in a universe where everything happens. But yes, I think that would be closer to the spirit of an Everettian. Yeah, but so so I think maybe the difference here uh, is that we're talking about sort of a, you know, the observer is an extended object in what we call branchial space. The observer spans, the 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 individual mind spans many different branches of history. Mm. And so... It's not that, uh, and, and the individual mind, which believes that it has a single thread of experience, spans many branches of history and is, is having to make, you know, is having to enforce consistency conditions to say, yes, it's really true that there's just one thread of experience. And it's not, it's non trivial to establish all those consistency conditions and make right. sure that they work out, so to speak. 
Um, and and how do you do that? I mean, how do you impose those consistency? Is that just from um, a rule from the outside where you say I need to impose? Okay. Interesting question. Okay, so this is, um, uh, we don't know all of this. In fact, I'm just a thing that I'm just writing right now is about what I call observer theory, mm. which is an attempt to have sort of an idealized version of what an observer does, just as things like Turing machines are idealized versions of what computers do. Yeah, right. and, and the fundamental thing that observers do is they equivalence things. You know, there's all the complexity of the world, and the observer is taking some sort of digest of all that complexity in the world and stuffing it into a finite mind. That's basically what you look at all kinds of different observers. And it, it's, it's non-trivial. So for example, in the case of gases, you can say an observer could be a piston that's measuring the pressure in the gas. And there are lots of different particular molecular impacts that could happen. But to the piston, all it cares about is the aggregate of all those impacts and how the piston is going to be pushed. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of physics that the piston has a, you know, there's a, it's a much more rigid object. And so even though every time a molecule hits it, it deforms a bit, there's kind of, so, so you can kind of, but, but the, the big idea of, of observers is they equivalence things. And it's a little bit confusing because in quantum mechanics, the, the big, oh, I measured that, that bit, that qubit or whatever, it's very much more like a, it's the different kinds of measurement. They're sure. really, I think about two kinds. One is things that aggregate stuff. And the other is things like weighing balances where it's either heavier on one side or heavier on the other side. And a lot of what's done in kind of the quantum information style of quantum mechanics is more like weighing balances than it is like the kind of the aggregate thing. What, what people do when they extract chemistry out of quantum mechanics and say, yes, we really have a water molecule that really has this shape, even though quantum mechanics is talking about lots of different shapes, that's more of the aggregation kind of, kind of measurement. Yeah. But this this question of, of what... Um, uh, kind of, okay, so what is the dynamics of measurement? Um, in our models, there certainly is an underlying dynamics to measurement, the cost of measurement, so to speak. We don't really know how that works yet. In fact, I'm literally just, the, the section right up on my computer is called the cost of observation. So it's, it's um, uh, the, the um, um, uh, but what we can roughly see is this. There are, um, Let's say you're trying to make a quantum computer and you're trying to use the fact that there are many threads of history. That's kind of what the, the big idea of a quantum computer is. You get to sort of run lots of computations in parallel. Yes. The, the, the thing that's difficult with a quantum computer is reading out the answer and getting, and getting it to fit in that single thread of experience that we humans have. Yes. Now, normally in quantum mechanics, we just say it's a measurement and it's just sort of a, a you know a, an instantaneous thing. We don't talk about how it works. It's just a mathematical construct. In our models, we do get to actually talk about how do these equivalences get established. We don't have a great model for that yet. We can say sort of how many elementary operations have to happen to make these equivalences occur. We can kind of try and count those. And so, for example, if we do start counting those, it doesn't look good with kind of the formal success of quantum computing. It seems like what you gain in those many threads of history, you lose in knitting together the threads of history so that we as humans can conclude that a definite thing happened. So that, that's a, but, but kind of this, this idea, you know, can we, can we look inside the measurement process? The answer is a bit, but I'm not happy with how far we've got on that. But presumably you can say with, with certainty, or correct me if I'm wrong, that you do not have anything like collapse of the wave function. That is not the way. Yeah, it's not. It, I, it, gosh, it's so hard to say because because you know the when our observers aggregate sort of different paths of history, I I don't know how to I I don't know how to relate that necessarily. Well, do you have unitary? Do you have global unitary? Yes, yes, yes. Then yes, then it's yes. pretty clear. Yeah. So I, I suspect that you know the the old ideas of collapse of the wave function probably are not. Yeah, right going to be going to be singled right. out in, in the so, so, power. right but so by the way just to give a, another piece of what what's going on so we have this multi-way graph of all these different paths of history and one of the things you can do is say let's look at what state things got to at a particular time let's make a particular sort of cut through this multi-way graph and then we ask well what's you make that cut 
what's the kind of spatial direction of that cut? We know time is going down, let's say, yeah. what's across? We call that branchial space, the space of quantum branches. Wait, and wait, say it again, what is branchial space? One more time. It's sorry. the, it's the, it's, you make this multi-ray graph. So imagine yeah. you're playing tic-tac-toe, you've got all these different possible, possible moves you can make. Yeah. Now you say at a particular time, let's just slice across all those possibilities. And we've got a bunch of those little ends. Yeah. Of this is the move that got made. Now, what is the coordinatization of branchial space? Uh, what we tend to do is to say, what is the common ancestry of those? So we've got two little, uh, you know, states here. We say states that were had a common ancestor one step back. We say those are connected by an edge and a branchial graph. And then we look at that large scale branchial graph, and that gives us a space, just like we're constructing physical space out of this hypergraph. Sure. Sure. We construct this branchial yep. space. Yep. And so then the question is, what's the interpretation of branchial space? And okay, our in, in certain approximations, our guess is that branchial that position in branchial space is quantum phase. So in other words, what what in standard quantum mechanics, one of the things that you know one sets up in the mathematics. You, of you literally mean the, the the phase of a wave function. I mean it? the phase of a wave function, the phase of a quantum amplitude. So that, that in other words, that that what you know, standard quantum mechanics, you know, complex numbers are a big thing. And, you know, there's this idea that we don't describe things in terms of you know, probabilities, we describe in terms of quantum amplitudes, quantum yeah. amplitudes are complex numbers. My guess is that the packaging of sort of magnitude of the of the uh, of of the quantum amplitude and phase of the quantum amplitude into a single complex number is the same mistake that Minkowski made packaging space and time into a single <laughs> space time object. Wow. So my guess is that that the the magnitude is associated with the counting of paths in the multi-ray graph, and the phase is associated with the position in branchial space that you end up. So now yeah. here's where here, here's where it gets really wild. So now the question is, how do you think about geodesics in these essentially in the multi-ray graph? You're thinking about kind of shortest paths, and you're thinking about how do the shortest paths get formed, and what deflects the shortest paths. So what, and again, I'm eliding a bunch of sort of technical detail, not all of which I would say we're, we're, I consider we've completely nailed down, but the qualitative picture is the presence of energy and momentum deflects these paths in this multi-way graph or effectively in branchial space. And so what we're saying is that that energy momentum is sort of moving around where we end up in branchial space. So in other words, energy momentum is, is changing our quantum phase. And so that, you know, what, what in, in, in quantum mechanics, the path integral is precisely saying that the presence of relativistically invariant, you know, energy momentum, the action is what changes the quantum phase. And so what we're saying is that, which I find very amazing, is that what in physical space, gravity, is the effect of energy momentum on deflecting GD6 in physical space. In the in branchial space, the energy momentum deflects also deflects GD6, but it deflects effectively GD6, which associ associated with, with position in branchial space. So in other words, what, what in physical space is gravity deflecting things in, in branchial space is the path integral associated with the way that energy momentum changes quantum phase. I, so are you is, all, is, is it just a technical detail? I mean, the action is not quite energy, right? Indeed. So Indeed. Is, that, is, that, is that an- it's, That's a technical detail. I mean, you okay. can, you can you, you know, it, it seems to work out correctly. I mean, it's it's this, you, you know- You get the right sign, get, you get the right S-I-G-N, you get the right sign between yes. kinetic and potential and- Yes, I think so. I mean, the, I, you know, I will say that that the, you know, let me let me rank the kind of ways in which these derivations have been done. Okay? okay, physicists have a way of doing derivations which mathematicians say are hopelessly unrigorous. Okay, and and for example, the derivation of, uh, you know, the gas laws or something from molecular dynamics. That is hopelessly mathematically unrigorous. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 I think, can be made more rigorous by thinking about computational irreducibility and so on. But right. it's, it's, um, 
in the traditional way of doing it, it's so the the thing the derivations that we have are I would say on the slightly more risque end of physicist derivations. Okay, right. Right. and we are working hard to fill those in with things that are more mathematician, you know, style derivations. But that particular thing, I, I that particular thing is not an issue because the Lagrangian density is what. Uh, why is that? That's because. I, I'd have to think about okay. this. I haven't thought about this for a while, but but the, that that particular thing is not an issue. Um, where does that, so? Let me turn to maybe a more conceptual issue that I'm unclear on. Where would something like the Born rule come from? Yeah, that, yeah, good that, question. That, you know, just again for the audience that you know Max Born famously 1926 gave us the what we believe is the right interpretation of a quantum wave function in terms of what it means for our observations. You take the norm squared of the wave function or the amplitude, as Steve was saying, and, and from that you get the probability of getting this or that result. But that sort of comes from the outside. You know, it's not in the basic equations yeah. that you know, they're, they're the dynamics of the system. So how does it show up or does well, it show up? We have up arguments, you? right? We have arguments for it. I do not think they're mathematically adequate. And actually we're just, that's something, just one person who's been working on this has just been working on that and seems to have made some progress in that that area of being able to sort of rigorously derive the Born rule. I okay. mean, it, it, you can we can argue for it, but I would say that that you know we should be able to just outright derive it, and we haven't been able to do that yet. Now, let me give an indication of something like the double slit experiment, a typical sure. quantum experiment of roughly how one thinks about that in these models, because it's a little weird. So, you know, what happens? You've got this photon; it can go through either one slit or the other. One of the mysteries is. That it can have interference, where destructive interference, where you know you'd say, well, the photon must have gone through this slit or that slit. How can it be the case that at some particular place on the screen behind there are just no photons arriving? Yeah. Um, okay. So in our models, what seems to happen is that these two photons wind up. They you know they go through these slits and they wind up at some place in physical space. They also wind up at some place in branchial space. And both photons go through slits, and they wind up in a particular place in physical space, particular place in branchial space. And what seems to happen is the following. But that, I'm sorry, why two photons? I don't mean to get the, but I mean, I would love you to explain this with one photon. Okay, that's okay, really okay. We, we could say one one photon that, that let's, um, uh, you know, this this question of, of, okay, we could say one photon and it's, you know, it's, it's, amplitude, to use the traditional way of thinking about it, winds up partly in one place in physical space, partly in one place in okay. branchial space. Okay, So this question of what qualitatively is destructive interference, um, I think the picture is this. The observer is an extended but localized sort of thing in branchial space. So it is it is observing a piece of branchial space that's that's extended, but it's finite. Mm -hmm. But now what ends up happening, I think, is that these two sort of possibilities for the photon wind up at two different ends of branchial space. And so an observer who is a bounded observer in branchial space just says, I don't know what happened to the, the, the photon because I can't, I can't construct a reality in which I, I see both pieces, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, and that's kind of where did the photon go? Well, it got lost in branchial space, and I mean that, that's a very qualitative way to put it. But can um, you give me some feel for where I get the interference fringes in the double slit from from that description? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. So, so you have to dig much deeper into kind of this mapping between quantum phase and position in branchial space. Mm -hmm. And as I say, uh, I mean, this is another one of these things where the mathematics we have a kind of a hokey derivation of this. Which I'm not satisfied with, uh, in which one does get interference fringes, but I'm not convinced by it. I mean, it, okay. it's a, it's, it's it really, it's this question of um, uh, the the understanding of what branchial space is and how it works is complicated. It's a different kind of space than people have seen before. Kind of understanding how it relates to the Hilbert space that one sees in quantum mechanics is not, you know, those pieces are not put together. Right. So, you know, okay. I can give. You know, it is interesting to see in our models what I find one of the interesting things is that there are phenomena in physics where we can give kind of logical arguments for why they are that way, 
but we've not been able to give mechanistic arguments for why they are that way. So for example, another one is time dilation and relativity. So here's, here's, a, here's a way to think about that in our models. So, you know, the, it's, it's uh, for other people's benefit. I mean, it, it's more or less the, you know, things that are going faster, time seems to run slower for them. So in our models, what is, you know, the running of time is this computational process. So a thing stays in one place and it computes its next state, next state, next state. Now let's say the thing is moving. In order to move, it has to reconstruct itself in different places in space. That reconstruction process costs computational effort. There are computations needed to do that reconstruction of the thing at different places in space. So what happens is you're using up computation, your computation budget, repositioning yourself, reconstructing yourself at a different place in space. So you have less computation budget left over, so to speak, to update yourself in time. And that's the sort of, in our models, that's the mechanistic explanation of time dilation, which is, to me, I mean, you know, it's it, we can derive time dilation easily by sort of logical argument, so to speak. But, but do you get like of, the right the right factor? Oh, I yeah, mean, yeah, you, get, yeah. you get gamma, yeah. gamma yes, yes, one yes. over the Absolutely. square, one minus v squared over. Absolutely. But and you're putting in, but just, so you must put in the speed of light, right? I mean, that certainly is not something that your model gives you from, Absolutely. from the outset. But that's just but, a but the ratio, but there is some ratio that naturally is the speed of the object to the speed of light. Yes. Yes, and the reason that happens, okay, is, is when you, in in space, there's this big network, but the thing that really matters in space-time is the causal graph that says, this update happened here, how is it related to some other update that happened? So some updates are time-like related in the sense that the next update can't have happened until the previous one has already happened. Some updates can be space-like separated in the sense sure. that they're, you know, they could happen simultaneously. And... So what, what's happening is, in this causal graph, effectively all the causal edges are in some sense going at the speed of light. And these causal edges are by definition kind of light-like edges. And so what you're, what you're looking at is then, uh, then the derivation is actually rather straightforward. I see, it's um, just like a geometrical factor then at that point between yep. how you slice the, uh, yes, the graph. Yes, that's right. Uh, um, if you don't, can we go back to quantum mechanics? Though, for yes. a moment, because there was a question there. Do you have any means by which you take the classical limit of? I mean, w because you know the. Yeah. If I understood correctly, the starting point for getting to a quantum description was this fact that you could have these these different branches from applying your rules, say in in different orders. Yep. I don't see how you sort of continuously get rid of that which is normally how we think of getting to the classical limit you know we have this idea of h bar goes to zero which is a weird idea since h bar is actually dimensionful but we can make sense of it so so how do you take that limit right so i mean it's the same thing as in space so the the you know getting to in in space there's this it, it's a question of how big is the observer relative to the the elementary length in space yeah. And so similarly here, how big is the observer in branchial space relative to kind of these elementary sort of distances between branches? And so H bar is roughly, I mean, qualitatively, not yeah. some, uh, is roughly just as the, the speed of light is associated with, you know, given, okay, so given a certain amount of time, given one elementary time, how far did the causal edge go in one elementary time? Answer it went the speed of light times the elementary time by distance. definition, yeah. right? And so, roughly, it's the same kind of thing that after one elementary time, the branchial edges are roughly h bar away from each other in branchial space. Okay, so, so by the way, that means that in the way our model is set up, just as there's a speed of light that governs the maximum rate of inform at which information can propagate in physical space, there is an analogous quantity, the maximum entanglement speed. That is the maximum speed that information can propagate in branchial space, and that's a new thing that hasn't hasn't been a story in quantum mechanics before, and and that's a thing which we are kind of wondering whether, when for example black holes merge, whether there is a sort of the rate of merging is partly limited by the speed of light, and partly limited by the maximum entanglement speed, and so that's a, we don't know. 
I, again, as I said, there's this one parameter in our model. So elementary length, elementary time, or maximum entanglement speed. You can pick any of these. We don't know the maximum entanglement speed. Um, but you know, that, that's another thing that, for example, limits the rate at which black holes can merge, that quantum black holes can merge. But does it also, again, uh, maybe I'm again interpreting it too much at face value, but if we have a typical case of an entangled pair, are, are you saying that if I measure the spin of particle one on, that particle two, say, would have the opposite spin in the canonical setup, but somehow there's a propagation speed, which is to do with this entanglement speed? Uh, yes. But it's not in physical space. Sure, so, I understand that. Yeah, that, yeah, right. So, so there's a. I mean, this is a, these are good questions, and you know, this is sort of stuff we're actively trying to figure out. I mean, mm -hmm. in other words, there's a the um, a bunch of these kind of quantum constructions um, of um, uh, you know ch sh whatever it is. These these um, uh, you know, sort of quantum correlation constructions. Yes. Um, the question is, how do those work in our models? And can we find a sort of a physical way in which in some quantum many body system or something, we can actually measure maximum entanglement speed? We haven't figured that out yet. And so where would you put the goal? I mean, for instance, back in the 80s, the goal of a string theorist like me and many of my colleagues back then, we envisioned that we have this approach to physics that really only has one parameter in it, the string tension, the string length. And we envision one day being able to calculate from first principles things like the mass ratios of the elementary particles, the coupling strengths of how these particles influence each other and how the various forces of nature act on these particles. As the years went by, we began to modify our view of what was likely achievable because even though the fundamental theory didn't have any knobs in it to tune when we began to look at things like the theory had extra dimensions and they needed to be compactified to a smaller scale we began to see knobs and things that we could vary entering in the theory through the precise shape and size of the extra dimensions and various adornments which those extra dimensional spaces supported. Where are you? Do you envision that this Ur-like computational view to how reality functions will, in principle, predict the mass ratios of the electron to the muon one day? I mean, wh where's the ambition and, and where do you think you are in that process? Yeah, I think the answer is yes, it will predict it. But it will predict it for observers like us. And by the way, even in traditional quantum field theory, yeah. the mass of the electron depends on the observer. In other words, the, the mass of an electron depend, you know, in the renormalization group, for example. Oh, you, you mean in terms of the energy scale at which you measure it? Is that what you yes. mean? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. I right. mean, there's, there's, there's uh, you know, you measure the mass of the electron by kicking the electron yeah. a certain amount. And, you know, that gives you the mass and the amount you kick it depends on, you know, gives you a different mass. And there's, you know, going to quantum field theory once being able to calculate that running mass, so to speak. So it's, it's you know, we already know that there is observer dependence to these things. So, but we probably have a good enough character, it probably, we have a good enough characterization of us as observers that I, I think my expectation is, yes, these things will be computable for observers like us. And, and I think, you know, in, so let me give you some predictions about this is meta predictions about models. So, you know, for example, I think black holes and particles are going to turn out to be incredibly closely related and may even be pretty much the same thing. That is that the, um, which is kind of, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're both kind of defects in the structure of space time. And, you know, they've come from very different places in general relativity and in kind of the ways we've thought about particles, but that's, you know, that's one possibility. Um, I think that uh, this question of, of, you know, for example, in, in quantum field theory and in, in the standard model of particle physics and things, we have this local gauge invariance idea, this idea of, you know, what, what, what leads to sort of fundamental forces and so on. Local gauge invariance looks, it, it looks fairly clear how that will emerge in our models. The question is... I mean, like, does, like, like compact Lie groups naturally? Yes, emerge? yes, yeah. yes. So, so just like 
the limits of this hypergraph is, okay, so when we think about this hypergraph, we think about you know, all the different nodes in the hypergraph, and we can say these nodes in the hypergraph are at a certain spatial distance apart. We can attribute some spatial distance between them. But inside that hypergraph is bundled up all the internal degrees of freedom, as well as the external, as well as kind of the, the, the physical space. There is also internal degrees of freedom. So what we have to do, more technically, we're dealing with, you know, can we distinguish the base space and the fibers in a fiber bundle? Can That's we... what I was about to ask you. Yeah, okay. Right. So, so the issue is, and we've got toy models of this, where we can sort of distinguish the, the aspects of the hypergraph that are the base space, the physical space, versus the aspects that are fibers, the internal degrees of freedom. Presumably, you so, actually really need sheath theory, I would imagine, if you're doing yes. this. Yes. Okay. Yes. And it, it, it very, I mean, one of the things that's fun with this is I had never really understood category theory before that, you know, really working on this. And we need the, the most limiting case of kind of higher category theory. I mean, this really ad object is deeply related to things that Grothendieck studied in the so-called infinity groupoid. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very, it's very lovely that, that these things are, I mean, one of the things that to me is, is exciting about the things we're doing is that, you know, it's, it's one thing would be, oh, is string theory right? Are we right? You know, these are two different kind of poles, but I don't think that's the way it is at all. I think that most of the theories in mathematical physics that have been well-developed have something useful to say. And, you know, we may have a machine code that is a thing from which, into which these can all be attached, but it isn't the case that it's like, oh, that was the wrong track. It's, mm. it's like, and, and, and that same thing is happening with some of these sort of higher mathematical concepts. But do you see any evidence of things like, you know, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1? I mean, I mean, okay, is there so this any... is the question that, that, that just like, okay, so let me explain. In, in, in our big graph, you can say, oh, there are these, um, uh, that there's, there's kind of this, uh, the spatial extent. Now you can ask, what about, for example, rotational invariance? Yes. You're at a particular place in the graph and you say, if I were to rotate things, would I have something that looks the same? Well, that's a graph theoretical question because you can wrote, you can you can say you've got one graph that's here, and then I've got another graph that's kind of at an angle, and I can ask, can I match up those two graphs? Can I make a graph transformation where I'm re retangling the graph, but it's still the yeah. same graph? Okay, it's an automorphism of the graph, and so the 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 question then becomes sort of what just like we've said, oh, in the limit, this this uh, this graph behaves like a manifold or something, we can ask when we're looking at these rotation-like things, is, is the limit of that something like a Lie group, something like a continuous group, okay? And so the thing we don't know is just like we don't, can't derive the number three for the dimensions of space. It is, I think, conceivable. I'm not saying it will happen this way. I think it's conceivable that for a wide class of models that that everything will be a subgroup of E8 or something, that, the, that it will necessarily be the case that the thing we derive as being that internal Lie group degree of freedom, so to speak, has to have certain characteristics. I, I don't know that that's the case, but I think the things we're seeing so far make it not completely crazy that that would be the case. Well, make, um, it E8, then, make it E8 cross E8, and then we have definite resonance. With, uh, <laughs> yes, with yes, yes, yes. Right. You know? Yeah, well, I mean, we just don't know. This is, this is one of these things sure. where you're, you're kind of, you know, there is a, there's, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a, it, you know, the thing that is both exciting and kind of humbling is, you know, the model is right there. Now we just have to do the hard work of figuring out what its consequences are. And if it turns out the consequences are crazy and don't agree with what we observe physically, then we're out of luck. But I have to say, at this point, I'm that's I don't think that's going to happen because too much has. How many worked. people are? How many people are working? Um, is it is it you in a in a small team or? Well, I mean, it's it, locally we have this thing we call Waltham Institute, which is a small small group of people. But there's there's a a wider collection of people who've worked on different different aspects of this, and I think that the. Um, I mean, the I don't know. It's I haven't counted because it's not really a. I mean, there's a there's a small inner group, so to speak, which is a modest number of people. But there's you know that and there's a, a certain amount of bridge work that's been done to whether it's to categorical quantum mechanics 
or to other kinds of fields where people are like, well, you know, we're really working on categorical quantum mechanics, but we're doing it in the context of the connections to this model. I see. So it's okay. it's some. Um, I mean, I think the uh, uh, kind of you know the way physics tends. Well, I don't know physics. I I've been out of physics as a. I haven't been professionally doing physics in 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 forty something years, but it used to be the case. I I I happened to be lucky enough to work on physics. You know, in the late nineteen seventies, when it was having kind of a golden age of the sort of arrival of quantum field theory, and then. Yeah subsequently cosmology, which I was quite involved in. And, uh, uh, you know, that was the kind of the, the, my, the, my sort of feeling for the, um, uh, at that time, there was this great tendency for everybody, you know, some new thing would happen and every everybody physicist jumped would, on it. Yeah. Yes. Right. And, um, I think, uh, you know, that would be nice if, the, if that, if that, uh, you know, if more people, the, the thing about what we're doing is that, you know, some of it is very paradigmatically similar to mathematical physics. Some of it really plugs into mathematical physics, but quite a lot of it does not. Quite a lot of it is more like distributed computing, mm -hmm. you know, mathematical logic, uh, just, you know, computer experimentation, things like this. And it is somewhat paradigmatically different. Um, and, and also I would say that, that, you know, this is what I get for having spent 40 years building tools. The tools we have are pretty you know, streamlined and efficient. And there's a lot of things where it's pretty easy for me, given those tools, to jump pretty far relative to what people are used to doing and yeah. kind of the steps that they take in doing mathematical physics and so on. So that makes it, you know, there's a lot of kind of alien stuff that yeah. gets made possible by that. And that I think makes it, you know, in a sense, I, I've been sort of, uh, you know, as time goes on, the, the you know, it, it, the tower that we're building gets a bit taller and it gets a bit more difficult to kind of, you know, when people sort of get involved, we do the summer school and winter school about this project. And, you know, that's sort of, it's getting challenging to fit kind of the, what we know so far into a few weeks of lectures. Of um, and that's, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I think that, that that's kind of, but, uh, you know, to me, you know, the more people we can get involved, the better. Right now, I mean, one of the frustrating things is that a lot of experimental physicists who are like, we've got a telescope, we've got a particle accelerator, you know, we would like to look for something unusual and interesting, just tell us what to look for. Right. And we're still in the situation where we're like, we don't really know yet. Hey, um, we, we've, we've been in that position in string theory for quite some time. So well, I, you I, see, I, but this is, this is why we need to make the right bridge to string theory, because we want yeah. to make use of everything you guys have figured out. And yeah, maybe you'll find great. what we figured out useful. I think one of the things that's been exciting for me about about this project is that, for example, I I said there'll be you know people said what are you working on? I say fundamental theory of physics. People say oh that doesn't sound very practical, and I'm like yeah you know it might have applications in 200 years. Um, and uh, the surprise to me is that I was wrong about that. There are actually applications now to distributed computing because the model that we have of the structure of space-time is basically a model that you can think of as events happening and so on. And that is, you can think of that as being a big distributed computation. And so the ways that we have to think about space-time now becomes ways to think about, now become ways to think about distributed computing. Right. So we're starting to think about, you know, programming in a certain reference frame, things like this. So we're importing, by using the fact that we have a common formalism, we're able to start importing successes from physics into other areas. So to my surprise, there actually seem to be some pretty near-term applications of not the, so much the physics side of this, but the, the bridge that's made to physics from, from the kinds of things we're doing. Yeah. Well, I can make you a pledge right now for whatever it's worth. You correctly calculate the electron to muon mass ratio, and I will drop everything that I'm doing and, and that's work That's going to be a challenging right. one. Give yeah. me something, you know, I, I've, uh, <laughs> that, that um, uh, you know, the time when we can see what um, uh, the, um, you know, uh, it's, you know, getting 206 is, um, is, yeah. is uh, you know, I'm, I'm not counting on that being soon. I have to say, some things about these models have just dropped much more easily. Like the, mm -hmm. the idea of what energy is. I thought that was going to be a long, hard, I, I thought this whole thing was going to be a maybe we could talk about what happens in the first 10 to the minus 100 seconds of the universe, but we'd never have things to say about kind of things that are more 
obviously connected to sort of current uh, reality. I think the other thing that's been a, a very interesting surprise is this fact that the, the methods we're developing are practically useful to people who are doing things like numerical relativity. Mm. That's that's the thing yeah, I didn't that's true. I, I, I didn't I didn't know that 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 is true. I mean the numerical yeah, yeah. relativity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that seems to be. I mean I don't know. We've been uh, Jonathan Gorard, who's been one of the people working on this, who's been um, has been traveling around talking to numerical relativity groups who are starting to use software that he's produced that is based on our models. So that that's a that's encouraging. Um, and yep. uh, you know I think I think that's some um, um, so. Uh, yes, electron muon mass ratio. I'm not counting on that one anytime soon. Right. I, you know, I might get you an E8. I think an E8 would already be impressive enough. Well, but, you know, because of the classification of compact Lie groups, again, the small number in some sense of truly distinct ones that are out there. I don't know if that would okay. gra grab okay. me as fully as it may grab others. But I can't help but make one comment, which is you noted that in your approach, the relate there may be a relationship between black holes and, and elementary particles. That would be yep. interesting. I don't know if you're aware of it, but a paper that I wrote with Andy Strominger and Dave Morrison some years ago, we found something of exactly that sort. We found in string theory that if you have certain shapes manifold through the extra dimensions and you take a particular subspace within it, like a sphere, and you collapse it down to a sufficiently small size, it can look like a black hole for most of that motion, but when you actually collapse it right down to zero, there's a smoothing of the space in which that black hole turns into an elementary particle. So cool. there's a, yeah, so there's a direct link that we found through certain kind of deformations of the extra dimensions that was a direct link between black holes and elementary particles. So again, whether that has an incarnation in anything that that well, in your approaches, you know, it just uh, certainly jumped out to me when you said yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's very really cool. I didn't know that. I mean, I, yeah, I think the no. the um, um, it's it's um, uh, it's funny because you know I knew the physics of 1980 or so pretty well. Yeah, and then right. I've been kind of in in uh, uh, in you know it's like a cryonic freezing. <laughs> for, uh, um, where I was only partly paying attention for a long time. Right. But, um, no, I mean, that, that, that type of result is interesting. And that's, you know, that's exactly why one should try to make a, a better bridge between our models and string theory, because one might be able to see, you know, how that really, you know, fleshes out and, uh, you know, in our models and then in string theory, see how that really, you know, I, I, this this extra dimensions thing is going to I, I don't know we'll we'll see but I, I think yeah. this idea that you're kind of lifting out of this hypergraph both the spatial direction and internal degrees of freedom I think is you know I don't know how related that is but I think that's going to wind up being you know I mean it, it's that that has a certain I don't know there's a certain Kaluza Kleinness or something to the whole um, you know to that whole kind of way of thinking about things but. But I would, I that that will be my my guess for how that will how that will end yeah. up working out, and that that in fact, you know, again that that one will, you know, if if you know, I as I say, I I, I think the the thing that to me is really interesting is it's not like in my view, you know, there's sort of a a sense of where mathematical physics has gone, and I just don't think I think that there's been, I mean it. it it's kind of analogous, I suppose, to what happened in the early days of computation, where people had different models of computation, and then Turing machines came along, and that was kind of a way of of anchoring a bunch yeah. of different kinds of ideas. And then you could take these these models that have been often much more difficult to understand, and you had kind of this pretty mechanistic way of thinking about them, and you could build a whole lot of stuff from it. So I'm right. I'm kind of that's my yeah. that's my qualitative view about what what I think can happen. And it's yeah, it's, well, um, look, it's a uh, it's wonderfully exciting stuff and i think as we all know if you're gonna shoot for the stars you've got to be willing to fail miserably and so you have to be bold and so you're certainly being bold and it'd be fascinating to see how this develops so i'd love to check in at some point again with an update on where things are look i'd also hope today to speak about but we'll put it off hopefully for another conversation if you're willing to do so the whole ai stuff and and consciousness and free will and all those wonderful ideas but um you know when you have an opening in your schedule in the future it'd be great to connect again yeah, and that, I'd, be, up, I'd be happy to talk about that i've got the ideas. 
this week's fun thought is quantum LLMs. But we'll ah, leave that there for you another go. time. There you go. That's, okay, so that's intriguing um, enough. The, All right, so so um, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll we'll talk again at some point in the not too distant future. Yep, lovely Great to, to lovely to, to chat. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, everybody, that wraps up this uh, live session, which. Um, if I'm being completely honest and too much information and partly wrapping up because I've got to use the facilities and sitting here any longer will be definitely dangerous. But it's been a, a wild ride in this conversation with Stephen Wolfram, as we expected it to be, trying to perhaps find the underlying computational structure to all the things that we as physicists have for the last hundred years been enamored with statistical mechanics, special relativity, general relativity, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory. And who knows? I mean, the thought that there might be some deeper underlying structure that allows us to understand where these laws come from and as well tie it to the fact that we are the observers that are aware of these laws. Well, it certainly is bold, big, exciting. Who knows if it will pan out, but that's the nature of being at the cutting edge. So thanks so much for joining us for this live conversation. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel or subscribe at worldsciencefestival.com to be updated on the various programs that we are undertaking. Uh, about a week ago, we released a wonderful conversation on AI. Some of you may have seen it. If you've not, you should check it out with uh, Jan LeCun, Sebastian Bubeck, and Tristan Harris, where we really describe the inner workings of some of the LLMs that Steve Wolfen just made reference to, as well as discussed some of the potential dangers, or as some of the programs suggested, the overinflated view of those dangers of AI going to the future. We'll be releasing shortly. I believe our next release will be a program on cosmology that we had at our live events in September. And please, as well, keep your eye on, we will shortly release a really wonderful conversation on string theory, the state of string theory that we had at that event with David Gross, Ed Witten, Andy Strominger, and myself, really trying to give a feel for where we are. You know, here we are, 2023, these ideas began in 1968. Where are we in the process of trying to realize the potential of string theory? And so that program will be released in the not too distant future as well. All right, I think that's about it on the updates. Again, subscribe to our YouTube channel, go to worldsciencefestival.com, subscribe to our newsletter, and we will be having a number of these live conversations going forward. But for now, that's it here from Columbia University, my office here, this World Science Festival live event. I'm Brian Green. Thanks for joining us.